Testing, testing, testing. How's everybody doing? Good. Good. Good to see everybody here on Saturday. And uh, we'll go ahead and get started. So we'd ask everybody to stand up. We're going to go ahead and open up. Our Father, which art in heaven. Our Father, which art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. Thy will be done. In earth. In earth. As it is in heaven. As it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts. And forgive us our debts. As we forgive our debt to all. As we forgive our debt to And lead us not into temptation. And lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil. But deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom. For thine is the kingdom. And the power. And the power. And the glory. And the glory. Forever. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. That he is good. For he is good. And his mercy endures forever. And his mercy endures forever. Praise the Lord God of Israel. Praise the Lord God of Israel. For he is good. For he is good. And his mercy endures forever. And his mercy endures forever. These things we pray in Jesus' name. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Holy one of Israel. Holy one of Israel. The mighty one of Jacob. The mighty one of Jacob. The Lord of Lords. The Lord of Lords. The King of Kings. The King of Kings. Amen. Amen. Today's scripture reading will be taken from the 28th Psalm. Unto thee will I cry, O Lord, my rock. Be not silent to me. Lest that thou be silent to me, I become like them that go down into the pit. My hands toward thy holy oracle. Draw me not away from the wicked, and with the workers of iniquity, which speak peace to their neighbors with mischievous in their hearts. Give them according to their deeds and according to the wickedness of their endeavors. Give them after the work of their hands. Render to them their desert. Because they regard not the works of the Lord, nor the operation of his hands. He shall destroy them and not build them up. Blessed be the Lord, because he hath heard the voice of my supplication. I read unto you Psalms 28, verses 1 through 6. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All praise, all glory, all honors, most certainly due to the most high. God is paid charge. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Peace to you in the name of Jesus. I'm kind of truly blessed each and every single time that I can come before you to preach the word of God. Never do I count it as a light thing to do so. Today's message is sexual morality according to the Bible. Again, that message title is sexual morality according to the Bible. It's through the act of sexual intercourse that we and practically every species procreates. Sex definitely has its place, but its only place should be within the confines of marriage. Let me say that the subject matter, uh, demands subject matter right? demands frankness so i'll be frank today and frankly we are being socially conditioned to believe that sexual debauchery is normal and acceptable the dominant position mocks the notion of abstinence before marriage for our youth some say it is realistic but what is truly unrealistic is the belief that there are no consequences for sexual sins not only will the failure to bring your carnal flesh into subjection bring your entrance into the kingdom of God into question, <coughs> but on the path of eternal damnation. The pit stops on that path are STDs, unwanted pregnancy, emotional despair, abortion, self-degradation. People of God, we are and we should know God. Our people have accepted those standards. When I look at children, young, young men in the back and my own children and young people today, I work with young people. I wouldn't want to be young today, not dealing with what they deal with, not being exposed to what they are exposed to. And it is a, truly a, a trial and a job to try to protect your children and try to prepare them for the world that they're entering, <coughs> entering into. Because we just like Sodom and Gomorrah. And there's no putting the top back on this thing. There's no fixing the problem. The wheels have gone off. There's no morality when you look at the world, and particularly when you look in the Western world. The world tells us that he made, the word tells us that he made him male and female, that Adam knew his wife. Not a side piece, not a jump off, not even just his baby mama. Adam knew his wife, bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh. This is the relationship that one should desire, but there's no closer relationship between two human beings. 
The law tells us there shall be no whores or sodomites among the children of Israel. But when you look at us as a people, that's what you see. That's what you see. During the course of this lesson, we shall see that sex should only be between married individuals, male and female, because it's impossible for two men and two women to be married. We shall see that all other sexual relationships carry grave consequences in this line. And we shall also see that it can even cost you your eternal soul. We want to get right into it. And we're going to go to the very beginning and see what mandate was given by God. This is Genesis, the first chapter. Genesis, the first chapter, we're going to pick it up in verse 26. Genesis 1 and verse 26. You can go ahead when you get ready. And God said, mm -hmm. let us make man in our image, uh -huh. our likeness. Go ahead. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. talking to God. As it is written in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. So the fathers... Talking to the son and saying, God said, let us make man in our image. Because we you know we're talking to the angels because we're not in the image of angels. See, when you see the word God, here is Elohim, which is plural intensive. It's like the, the word family. It could be two or two thousand. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And that's something we should consider. See, a lot of the problem is we don't know what we are. We were made in the image and the likeness of God. See, he didn't make us to be sodomites. He didn't make us to be whoremongers. He didn't make us to be adulterers. That's not what he made. He made a being in his image. And, and what do you tell him? Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Certainly, if you're going to have dominion, certainly if you were made to rule, you should be able to rule yourself. You should be able to rule yourself. You have to have discipline when it comes to your own sexuality, we'll see. But verse 27. So God created man in his image. Uh -huh. In the image of God created him. Male and female created him. So it was said, and, the, and we know the word did it. You read in John 1, Colossians 1, Hebrews 1, that he created, the Father created the world through his son. So Jesus, before he was manifested in the flesh, it says, so God created man in his own image, in the image of God created he him. How did he do it? Male and female created he them. Male and female created he them. Male and female. Counterparts, opposites. And then what's the, what's the mandate that he gives? Go ahead. Verse 28. Uh -huh. And God blessed him. Go ahead. And God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. So he told them, he said, God blessed them, and God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and see a book don't need to tell you that you can just look you you understand what goes where and God's blessed them and God said unto them be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth see that's how you know homosexuality and same-sex marriage is wrong because even your it's against uh, natural law even your intuition tells you that sex with someone of the same gender, if you will, is inappropriate. And it is sterile when the mandate was to be fruitful and multiply. You know this. So you don't even need a book. We got the book. But you don't need the book to know that. Look at the world. Look how things function. Look at anatomy. So it's saying God bless them and God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. So he said, okay, be fruitful and multiply, but it's with condition. Because when you look at the world, people certainly, certainly try to do what it takes to multiply. Even as young as 13 years old, I saw a study this morning that said that black males, the age of 13 and under, and under in urban areas, already sexually active, 25%, already under 13. But it says, and God said, and God blessed them, and God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply. And it is conditioned with this. Let's go to Genesis, the second chapter, and we want to pick it up right in the 18th verse, because that mandate was supposed to be carried out within an institution. Let's find out about that institution, the most important institution amongst Mankind. Genesis 2 and verse 18. When you ready, go ahead. 
in the word God said. Uh -huh. It is not good that the man should be alone. So he said, it's not good that this man that I've created should be alone. What did he do? And said, I'm going to make a help meet for him, a help fit for him. That's what he made. So the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him help fit for or meet for him. Verse 19. And under the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. So he made all these animals and brought them unto Adam and Adam and his intellect, because it was already there. He wasn't a baby that had to form. He was a man when he was formed with seed inside of him to procreate. And then he brings these animals for him to name them. But let's see what was found amongst the animals. Verse 20. And Adam gave name to old cattle, uh -huh. to the fowls of the air, to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found to help me for him. So what was not found was his help me. Wasn't amongst the animals. So what did the Lord do? Go ahead. Verse 21. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. And he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. So what did he do? He put this, he performed surgery. What did he do when you perform surgery? You put somebody to sleep. Anesthesia. So he put him to sleep. And he took his rib, right? And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof, just like they close you up when they go back, when they go inside your body for surgery. The Lord did that to Adam, took his rib. And I don't believe, me, I don't believe it's a coincidence that he took his rib because the rib is a part of you that can grow back. It regenerates. But verse 22. And the rib was the Lord God had taken from man. What did he do with it? Made him a woman. He made him a woman. Notice he didn't make him another man. He made him a woman. Straight from him. So that's the oneness there. And the rib was the Lord God had taken from man. Made he a woman and did what? And brought her unto the man. He three. And Adam said, uh -huh. this is now bone of my bone. Go ahead. The flesh of my flesh. What's she called? She should be called woman because she was taken out of man. Even naming her. He named her, just like he named the animals. He named her. He said, she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. And what shall a man do? Go ahead. Therefore, shall a man leave his father and his mother uh -huh. and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. Again, it, it, he not cleaving to another man. He it don't say he cleaving to his baby mama. He not cleaving to his, it say his wife. Therefore, shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife. Why leave your father and your mother and cleave unto your wife? So you can fulfill that mandate of being fruitful and multiplying. And he said, and they shall be one flesh. So they are one accord. They literally, he hey, one flesh, become one flesh. We'll find out as we read. But let's go to Hebrews, the 13th chapter, because he instituted marriage in the very beginning. And then you see Eve was called the mother of all living. He had said, and then he said, had many sons and daughters. But what was it in? It was in the within the confines of marriage. Why marriage? Why marriage to bring forth children? Because it is within the confines of marriage that children are best cared for. Regardless of what the world will tell you, you need your mother and you need your father. You need them both. And both of them bring attributes that the child needs. Sometimes when you need to be nurtured, more than likely that will come from your mother. Not in every single case, but more than likely it will come from your mother. And when you need discipline and instruction, it's supposed to come from your father. Even though instruction does come from your mother too as well. But they both bring and they balance each other out. They're supposed to when they're working together. But if you got two men and two women talking about a baby, that that union automatically deprives the child from one of the parents that he or she needs. Hebrews, the 13th chapter and verse four. See, quite frankly, like I said, I'm speaking frank, frank terms today. Quite frankly, people have lost their minds. Hebrews, honorable. Marriage is honorable. You talking about two people coming together and being sexually intimate, it should be within the confines of marriage. What about everything else? And the bed under fire. So he said marriage is honorable and the bed under fire. Meaning what's going on in that bedroom, that's, that's nothing wrong with that as long as it's not violating any other laws. 
Marriage is honorable and all, and the bed undefiled, but what? But who among us and adulterers, God will judge. But who among us? Those who deal in the fornication, men, that hormones are men. I heard a, a woman say this is a long time ago. She said she wanted to be, she wanted to be like a man. I said, What are you talking about? She said, I want to be like a man, you know, a pimp. I said, women can only be whores. Men are whoremongers. There is a difference. There's a difference. And both of them are wrong. But let's get it straight and see what it is. See, people have lost their minds today. So it said, marriage is honorable and law in the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers, it said, God will judge. See, he has instructed us in how we are to behave in every way, what we should eat, even what we should wear, even how to maintain ourselves sexually. So he said he's going to judge. Now let's go to Exodus, the 22nd chapter. Because he had it even if, again, he upholds marriage. The first institution amongst men. Paul said marriage is honorable. Everybody else, God going to judge. Let's see. What happens if sex happens outside of the confines of marriage? Because that's even in the instruction that's given, which is Torah or the law. Let's see what he says. Exodus, the 22nd chapter and verse 16. Exodus 22 and verse 16. We ready? Go ahead. And if a man entice a maid that is not betrothed uh -huh. and lie with her, go ahead. he shall surely endow her to be his wife. So, now if a, so it's in the law that if a man entice a maid, and this is consensual now, that is not betrothed. Betrothed means she's not like we would we would call it being engaged or you're about to be married. See, one thing about the scripture, one thing about the law, being betrothed and being married are on the same level. You know that from the punishments that we'll read later. But it says, and if a man entice a maid that is not betrothed and lie with her, he shall surely endow her to be his wife. It don't mean when he lay with her, that was his wife. It meant that he had to go about the necessary steps to make her his wife. It's like not too long ago, what they would do if you, if somebody ended up pregnant, her father might come to you and say, you got, because that you went out of the order. So God put it in the, in the Torah, the instruction that he gave us. If you go out of order with this woman, you got to go about making her your wife. And what you would do is you would pay a dowry. The dowry is like a, uh, uh, something that you would give to the father. Verse 17. If her father utterly refused to give her unto him. What should happen? He shall pay money according to the dowry of virgins. He shall pay money according to the dowry of virgins. See, you want, so that's so, even if you go out of pocket is, and, and go and jump the gun and do this, he got it to where no, what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to make that your wife. It don't mean that she is your wife. I heard that doctrine. When I first got into the word, that when you lay with some woman, that's automatically your wife. That's not what the Bible is saying. What the Bible is saying is that you need you would go about the steps to make that woman your wife. Deuteronomy the twenty second chapter. See what you see going on right now, the sexual debauchery that you're going on, that's going on right now. He didn't want our people doing that. And you know that clearly from what he has placed in his word. Deuteronomy, the 22nd chapter and verse 13. Deuteronomy 22 and verse 13. It's a frank conversation. Deuteronomy 22 and verse 13. When you ready, go ahead. If any man take a wife and go into her. So if, he, if a man takes a wife and goes into her, he's consum to consummate the marriage. Because that's what consummates marriage. Sex don't make you married. Sex consummate, consummates a marriage. Consummates a covenant that is made between a man and a woman. If any man take a wife and go in unto her and hate her, and do what? And give occasions of speech against her. Saying what? And bring up an evil name upon her. Mm -hmm. And say, I took this woman, and when I came to her, I found her not a man. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Was they say, Houston, we have a problem? So he married this woman <laughs> with a pretext. Not like now. Well, they start the average, the average female, according to most statistics, starts having sex a little bit after 16 years old. But men on average is 17. I'm talking about in America. So you got that. Then you got your college years when you just acting a fool. Then you got that time until you meet somebody when you're 26 and 27, and you got you got body bodies galore. 
Skeletons all dropping out your car. You got all kinds of partners. And then, then you're going to get married. That's out of order. And many of us, you, we come into the word as an adult. But one thing about it, just like it took one generation to go off course, it just take one generation to fix it. So we should be setting an example for the young generation and for our children not to go down the same path. It should not be that we come into the world as an adult and have made all these mistakes in our past and in our children, we don't set a good example for them and they make the same mistake. That shouldn't be. We should see a difference amongst, at least amongst our children within the world. That's what we should see. So it says, this one, he went into this woman and found her not a maid. That meant he found that she was not a virgin. That was the expectation. Now, when you really think about this thing, if I had, if you just saw a bottle of water that was half drunk on that, on that counter right there, you ain't know whose it was. Would you just go up and start drinking from it? You'd be like, oh, that's nasty. But you're going to somebody that everybody didn't have. See, you got to see standards to save your life. That's real. Like I said, it's not going to be politically correct. So it said, then shall the father of the dance with her mother take and bring forth the tokens of the damsel's virginity unto the elders of the city and the gate. What's that? That was placed under the bed, on the bed rather, as a, a uh, cloth. Would keep that as, as a token of honor. She was an honorable woman. So when he said she wasn't a maid, the father could be like, hold on, I got proof that she was a virgin. And I've seen, literally seen families in the East that had these tokens of virginity. And it, you see a bunch of their families celebrating because it, this is honorable because our, our, our daughter was a virgin. And they celebrating and dancing. So it said, then the father of the dancer and her mother take and bring forth the tokens of the dancer's virginity unto the elders of the city and the gate. So the ones that were supposed to judge the matter, they bring this and they say, what did he say? Verse 16. And the damsel's father shall say unto the elders, okay. I gave my daughter unto this man to wife, and he hated her. So I, I brought my daughter to this man. That's another thing. People just jump in the gun. How in the world you just gonna sleep with some man's daughter? Because that, that daughter is under the protection. The Bible, how he set it up, is for the protection of women. He had a woman protected while she was under her father's roof, and then she would go directly from that to being under the protection and covering of her husband. That's how he set it up. So you had no right to go and deal with that woman in any kind of way without talking to her father first. So it said, and the devil's father shall say unto the elders, I gave my daughter unto this man to wife, and he hated her, in verse 17. And lo, he had given occasion to speech against her, uh -huh. saying, I found not thy daughter a maid. I found, he said, I found your daughter not a virgin. Go ahead. Yet these are the tokens of my daughter's virginity. But I got proof that she was a virgin. Go ahead. And they shall spread the cloth before the elders of the city. That's the evidence, verse 18. And the elders of that city shall take that man and chastise him. So he going to take that man and chastise They going to take that man and chastise him. Punish him. Go ahead. And they shall immerse him in a hundred shekels given to the father of the damsel, because he had brought up an evil name upon a virgin of Israel. You you even see that today. You see a lot of a lot of men, especially younger men when they're in high school, they're, they're just loud and sister about what they've done. Right? Or what she is. For whatever reason. So now this brother or this man, he's gonna lie on this sister, but the sister kept her integrity. He's the one that's lacking integrity. So he got punished, he got chastised, he got fined. And it says something though. It says, and because he had brought up an evil name upon a virgin of Israel, because she is honorable and she shall be his wife, he may not put her away all his days. She gonna be your wife. Ain't nothing you can do about it. Verse 20, what about if the thing be true though? But if this thing be true, uh -huh. and the tokens of virginity be not found for the damsel. But if you like, what, what, yeah, the elders ask the father, so uh, where are the tokens of virginity? And he, and he like, uh, you know what? I ain't got that. What's going to happen? 
Then they shall bring out the damsel to the door of her father's house. Uh -huh. And the man of her city shall stone her with stones as she die. That's why even when you look at Joseph and Mary, and she ended up pregnant, and he know he had laid with her, he was going to put her away privately. Why? Because he understand according to law, she could be stoned. Then they shall bring out the damsel to the door of her father's house, and the men of her city shall stone her with stones that she die. Why? Because she had wrought folly in Israel. Because she had wrought folly in Israel and done what? To play the whore in her father's house. See, he don't want whores amongst his people. But what you got today? That's all you got. That's practically all you have. He said, to play the whore in her father's house, so shalt thou put evil away from among you. See, he calls you dealing with somebody that's not your husband. Go ahead. Then they show both of them die. Now, wait a minute. I see. So now he's going to another issue. He said, if a man be found lying with a woman married to a husband, that's adultery, brothers and sisters. To adulterate is like the mixing of seeds. You mix the seeds in ground that shouldn't be mixed. If a man be found lying with a woman married to a husband, then they shall both of them die. Go ahead. Both the man that lie with the woman uh -huh. and the woman. So shall thou put away evil from Israel. And going back to the to the example that I gave earlier with the woman who was <laughs> who was brought in adultery to Jesus, and they said, uh, the law says stone, or what said you? He was just writing in the ground. We caught in the very act. What said you? He said he, he was without sin cast the first stone. He didn't say that something was wrong with the law. What he said was he who was without sin cast the first stone because they were partial in the law because they only brought the woman and didn't bring the man. And if you caught her in the very act, you know who she was committing adultery with. So it said the adulterer and the adulteress, the man and the woman is to be stoned. But they just going to bring the woman in their partiality. That's why he pricked their conscience with what he said. They had to drop their stones and walk off. Not that she was, not that it, that she was right, because she was wrong, but so was the man. But why you ain't bring him? If a man be found lying with a woman married to a husband, then they shall both of them die. Both the man that lay with the woman and the woman, so shall thou put away evil from Israel. You see how he's laying it out, and how you are to behave morally. So you supposed to have children within the confines of marriage. And if you, you're a man that deal with somebody who's not married or betrothed and y'all come together, you got to make that your wife. And then he's saying you shouldn't be dealing with some other man. Verse 23. If a damsel that is a virgin uh -huh. be betrothed to a husband Go ahead. and a man find her in the city and lie with her. So now if a man is, uh, if a woman is betrothed or that's like engaged. And she lied with another man that she's not engaged to, and she be a virgin. Go ahead, what it say? And you shall bring them both out of the gate of that city. That's why he liked to see marriage or uh, uh, being married and being betrothed equally. Because the one who slept with the woman that's betrothed to another man, bring that man and bring that woman to the, and say unto the gate of that city. Go ahead. And you shall stone them with stones that they die. Capital punishment. I just saw somewhere we need that they try to bring that back, stoning, but but don't you but go ahead. The damsel because she cried not being in the city. Uh-huh. And the man because he had humbled his neighbor's wife. So the damsel because she cried not, meaning it wasn't, or it was consensual rather. And it says, so she was in error, because she know the covenant uh, that she had entered into. And it said, and only had to be consummate, consummated through marriage, and it said, or through uh sex, and it said the uh the man, because he had humbled his neighbor's wife. So they, he put it on the same level. So shalt thou, so thou shalt put away evil from among you. Now let's go to Proverbs 6 chapter. Because there are consequences. You see, according to the law, what the consequences were. Let's see what, what, what Solomon writes concerning the consequences of adultery. Proverbs the sixth chapter and verse 23. Proverbs the sixth chapter and verse 23. When you're ready, go ahead. For the commandment is a lamp, uh -huh. and the law is light, 
and reproofs of instruction of the way of life. The commandment, the laws of God, the Torah, which is instruction. It's instruction. We call it law, but it's instruction. It actually instructs us on how to behave. Because without it, we have some instruction on the way of life. Let's skip down to verse 26. Are you ready? Go ahead. For by means of a whore's woman, a man is brought to a piece of bread. Uh -huh. And adulterers will hunt for the precious life. So now he said, for by means of a whore's woman, a man is brought to a piece of bread. You lose everything that you have. You must not lose your eternal soul, too. But you lose what you have monetarily. For by means of a whorish woman, a man is brought to a piece of bread. Destroyed. Because you're dealing with somebody that you shouldn't. See, we should take instruction. Take guidance from what the word of God is saying and apply this to our lives. So you should be dealing with someone if you're a man or you're about to be a man and you think, well, I want to get married one day. You shouldn't be dealing with a woman like this. It's about by means of a horse a woman, a man is brought to a piece of bread and the what? The adulteress will hunt for the precious life. And the adulteress, meaning the woman that's married to another, you certainly shouldn't be dealing with another man's wife. It said, well, hunt for the precious life. Then he asked the question, what did he say in verse 27? Can a man take fire in his bosom? And his clothes not be burned. Can you take fire? Can you hug fire and not be burned? We know the answer to that. Verse 28. Can one go upon hot coals and his feet not be burned? Can you walk upon hot coals and on fire and not feel it? We know the answer to that. Verse 29. He likens it to this. Go ahead. So he that goeth unto his neighbor's wife, uh -huh. whosoever touches her shall not be innocent. You're going to pay. So he that goeth into his neighbor's wife, Whosoever touches her shall not be innocent. You go pay. So he's telling you not to do that. Then he tells you something else concerning the matter. Verse 30. Man do not despise a thief if he steals to satisfy his soul when he is hungry. Go ahead. But if he be found, he shall restore sevenfold. He shall give all the substance of his house. And that's the law. So if a man is stealing because he's hungry, hey, you're going to repay it. And that's so you can repay that. Right? But what about if you sleep with another man's wife, though? Verse 32. Thank you. But whoso committed adultery with a woman lacketh understanding. Mm -hmm. He that doeth it destroyeth his own soul. You lacketh understanding and you bring in destruction unto yourself. Go ahead. A wound and dishonor shall he get. Uh -huh. And his reproach shall not be wiped away. You're going to get wounded, dishonored. Your reproach will be wiped away. Verse 34. But jealousy is the rage of a man. Jealousy is the rage of a man. Jealousy is a rage of a man. Well, a man will kill you over his woman. For jealousy is the rage of a man. Go ahead. Therefore, he will not spare in the day of vengeance. When it's time to get back, he's not going to spare. What the, what James Brown got the song, The Big Payback? Revenge. <laughs> get one with girlfriend. He ready, to, he ready to get some furniture moving. He said, for jealousy is the rage of a man, therefore he will not spare the day of vengeance. Verse 35. He will not regard any rants. He don't try to hit, well, I can pay you, brother. He ain't trying to hit none of that. Go ahead. Neither will he rest content, though thou give as many gifts. You can give him what you want. He, 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 you can't, rest, you can't uh, get restitution for that. Now let's turn to, uh, we still in Proverbs. Let's go to Proverbs, the fifth chapter. Because here, Solomon, in his wisdom, he tells you who you should be with. See, it's one you can be with. You don't want to be with a horse woman. You don't want to be with somebody else's wife. But who should you be with? This is Proverbs, the fifth chapter, and verse 15. Proverbs 5 and verse 15. When you're ready, go ahead. Drink waters out of thine own cistern. Wait a minute. Drink waters out of thine own cistern. You got a well at home? <laughs> That's your wife. Drink waters out of So be satisfied with your own water. With your own cistern. Drink waters out of my own cistern and what? And running waters out of thine own way. Let them be only thine own and not strangers with thee. Go ahead. Let that fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of thy youth. So he said, with your wife, that's who you should be with. Let thy fountains be dispersed abroad and rivers of waters in the streets. Let them be only thine. And not strangers with thee. Let thy fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of thy youth. Verse 19. Let her be as a loving hind and pleasant robe. Uh -huh. Let her breast satisfy thee at all times. Let her satisfy you at all times. Not a prostitute. 
Not somebody else's uh, wife, but your own. Let her breast satisfy thee at all times and be what? And be thou ravished always with her love. And be ravished always with her love. That's what you should do, verse 20. And why will thou, my son, be ravished with a strange woman uh -huh. and embrace the bosom of a stranger? So then he talks about strange. And strange can be foreign. A strange can mean whorish. It can mean two things. But now let's go to uh, 2 Samuel, the 11th chapter. Because here we see consequences for adultery. 2 Samuel, the 11th chapter. 2 Samuel 11 chapter, here we see what the greatest king Israel had, who was David. And in this instance, David was certainly in error. 2 Samuel 11 chapter. And we go ahead. Inspired. Uh -huh. At the time when kings go forth to battle, that David sent Joab and the servants with him in Israel. Mm -hmm. And they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Robar. But David tarried still at Jerusalem. So now his men are successful in their camp in their military campaigns, but he has uh, stayed in Jerusalem. Verse two. And it came to pass in an evening tide that David rose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. Uh -huh. And from the roof he saw a woman washing herself, and the woman was very beautiful to look upon. So now what the David just went out. It was nighttime. We don't know why he went out there. But we know he went up on the roof of the king's house and could see over. From his palace, he could see the land. And what did he see? He saw a woman washing herself, and the woman was very beautiful to look upon. It didn't say he went up there to see a woman to look upon her. Maybe I can go up there and see some fine women. He just went up there and happened to see that. Now, he saw she was beautiful. He said, wait a minute, verse 3. And David said and inquired after the woman. So now he wasn't in error to inquire about this woman's situation. He inquired, who is this woman? Is she available? Who is this? Keep going, please. And one said, is not this Bathsheba, uh -huh. the daughter of Eli, the wife of Uriah, the Hittite. So now the news comes back to David. Well, this is, this is Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah, the Hittite. Verse 4. And David sent messengers and took her. And she came in unto him and he lay with her. Now wait a minute. Now now you out of now you in error. Because that's adultery. And David sent messages and took her and she came in unto him. Once he inquired and he said, Oh, that's your riot's wife. That should have been the end of. Oh, okay, well. Let me go on back to sleep. No, that he took her and went in to her and lay with her, for she was purified from her uncleanness, and she returned unto her. And when and the woman conceived and sent and told David and said, I am with child. Six. And David sent to Joab saying, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. So now David got, has a plot here, verse 7. And when Uriah was coming to him, uh -huh. David demanded of him how Joab did and how the people did and how the war prospered. So now he, it seems as if, at least if you were Uriah, you think, oh, the king want to speak to me. Yeah, how's the, how's the war going? How's the campaign going? Go ahead. And David said to Uriah, go down to thy house and wash thy feet. And Uriah departed out of the king's house, and there followed him a mess of meat from the king. So, so the king got, man, he said he tried to set him up. So he gets, you know, hey, man, how's the war going? Can you talking to him, talking to him? All the while, he know he even got his wife pregnant. In his face. So then what happens, he says, Uriah, he said, man, go home, man. Take, I know you've been warned. Go ahead, go home. Because he's hoping when he go home, obviously you ain't seen your wife. <laughs> You go lay with your wife. He said, hey, man, he take this meat, too, which go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. So he got high the fact that he didn't got. See, this before more folks. This before that. So he didn't, he, didn't, he didn't try to make sure that he'll go home and sleep with his wife. So he could hide the fact that he got a pregnant because it's around the same time, and pro same proximity of time. So verse uh, verse nine, because what did Uriah do? Go ahead. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord and went not down to his house. But right, Uriah didn't go home like he like he just assumed or expected him to. Go ahead. And when they had told David, saying, Uriah went not down into his house, David said unto Uriah, Camest thou not from thy journey? Why then thou didst not go down into thine house? Man, why he didn't go home? 
Uriah has some integrity. Verse 11. Go ahead. And Uriah said unto David, the ark in Israel and Judah abide in tents. Uh -huh. And my Lord Joab and the servants of my Lord are encamped in the open field. Go ahead. Shall I then go into mine house to eat and to drink, to lie with my wife? As thou liveth, as thou so liveth, I will not do this thing. So he had one tablet. He said, listen, the ark is in tents. And my Lord Joab and the servants of my Lord are encamped in the open fields. They suffering on the battlefield. They ain't with their wives. Those are my comrades. How to go home and enjoy my wife. We Like you ever heard, of, you ever seen the, the bond that soldiers have? It's a, it could be a very strong bond if they done been in combat together. So he's like, no, I'm, I'm, I, I'm, my heart is still on the battlefield. I'm not going to engage in the luxuries of domestic life when we engaged in war. He said, he said, can I, should I then go into my house to eat and drink and lie with my wife? As thou livest and as thou so livest, I will not do this thing. Verse 12. And David said to Uriah, uh -huh. tarry here today also and tomorrow. Go ahead. I will let thee depart. So Uriah abode in Jerusalem that day and tomorrow. So he sent him back, but then what did he do? He sent a letter saying, listen, get Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle and where he fight and withdraw from him. So ultimately he committed adultery with the woman's, with the man's uh, wife and then had the man killed to cover it up. That's what David did. Now let's go to verse 13. Oh, excuse me, not verse 13, but uh, chapter 13. No, chapter, we had, we had verse 13. Verse 13. Yeah, sorry, verse 13. Go ahead. And when David had called him, he did eat and drink before him. And he made him drunk, and then even he went out to lie on his bed. Uh -huh. With the servants of his Lord, but went not down to his house. And it came to pass in the morning that David wrote a letter to Joab, and sent it by the hand of Uriah. And he wrote in the letter, saying, Take you Uriah at the forefront of the hottest battle, and retire ye from him, that he might be spitted. Smitten and died. And we know that's what happened to him. So he had Uriah killed. Now let's go into uh, chapter 12. We're going to pick it up at verse 7. Because, see, one thing about it, the Lord, see, you doing things in the dark. You think everybody see you mean at a hotel? God see you. <laughs> you mean at a hotel? You worried about your spouse or somebody else? You need to be worried about the most high. He see you coming out the Motel 6. He see you. You coming out like this. He, he see you, fool. <laughs> Uh, 2 Samuel 12, and we'll pick it up in verse 7, because here that Nathan, the prophet of God, is going to rebuke David for his action. And he gives the scenario of a man, two men, one rich that has everything, and one poor, and all he has is a little you land. And in order to uh, entertain and, and uh, be hospitable to his guests, the rich man take the one you lamb and slays the ewe lamb, takes it from the poor man instead of taking up his flock. So now, that don't seem fair. You have everything. You the king of Israel. Like you go up to your palace on top and you looking over. You got men fighting that you didn't send out there to war so that you can gain the spoils from war, so that you can gain power. Uriah out there, the everyday Joe, the average man, just trying to make it on the battlefield. And then you take his wife? But verse, so now let's pick it up at verse 7. We're in uh, 2 Samuel 7, or 12 and 7. When you ready, go ahead. And Nathan said to David, Thou art that man. Because when he got, got the scenario, when he told him to explain the scenario to him, he said, David said, That man should die. And David said, You the man. You the one has the rich man that has taken that you land. He said, And Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. Thus said the Lord God of Israel. What did he say? I anointed thee king over Israel. I anointed, now you understand how many people he could have did? He chose you. Even all the sons of Jesse want to appear before Samuel. Samuel looked upon his countenance and said, surely he's the king. What did the Lord say? The Lord told Samuel, I have not chosen him. He chose you. He sustained you when you were on the run with, uh, from Saul. He, he propelled you. And Nathan said to David, Thou art the man, thus said the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel, and what? And I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul. And what else did he give him? And I gave thee thy master's house, uh -huh. and thy master's wives into thy bosom, and gave thee the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been too little, I would moreover have given unto thee such and such things. So what did he give him? He said, I gave thee thy master's house. 
So the, his master, Saul, was king. He said, I gave you his kingdom. He said, I gave you his wives because that was that was not uncommon. You see that in the ancient world where you would have a king take over from another. They would lose everything they had, their concubines and their wives, whatever they would have, especially if they died. The, the coming in king would take them. Why? Because it was a sign as who was in charge. So it says, he said, I gave thee thy master's house and thy master's wives unto into thy bosom and gave thee the house of Israel and Judah. And I gave you this land and these people to rule over. And if that had been too little, he said, I would have given you more. He asked a question, verse 9. Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord? Why have you despised the commandment of the Lord? What commandment? Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not kill. Go ahead. To do evil in his sight. Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword. And has taken his wife to be thy wife. Uh -huh. And has slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. So you killed him by the hand of another people. These children of Ammon. You've taken his wife. Why have you done this? Now you got consequences. See, it's not just that when you're doing things that are wrong, brothers and sisters, and you're dealing in sin, that you're going to go to hell. Even though we know that that's not the case for David. But it's not just, in general, it's not that you just go to hell. It's that you got consequences for the, for the sin that you commit. Built-in consequences. It's wisdom in keeping the law of God. It will protect you from destroying yourself. It says, What for hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Thou hast killed your right Hittite with the sword and hast taken his wife to be thy wife and hast slain him with the sword of the children of the man. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from thine house. Meaning you're going to have conflict. You're going to have killing within your own household. And what? Because thou hast despised me and hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. Uh -huh. Thus said the Lord. Behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house. So now evils will come out of your own household. Go ahead. And I will take thy wives before thine eyes and give them unto thy neighbor. And he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of this son. So all your wives, he said, so your wives, your, your own neighbor. Somebody, when he's saying neighbor, he's talking about somebody in your own household because he just said that earlier. But neighbor, somebody close to you is going to lay with them in the sight of the son. Meaning before everybody. Go ahead. But now I did it secretly. So you're doing something. He said, you did it secretly, right? You lay with her. Don't nobody know, right? But I would, I would do this before all Israel. He said, but I would do this thing before all Israel and before the son. A lot of times you think you're getting away with something. And then my father said, you just getting by. You just getting by. Let's go right into the 13th chapter. We're going to pick it up at verse 1. Because here we see the consequences of David's sin of adultery. Second Samuel the thirteen chapter one, pick it up at verse one. We ready to go here. And it came to pass unto this that uh -huh. Absalom the son of David had a fair sister, whose name was Tamar. Uh -huh. And Abnon the son of David loved her. Okay, so now this is uh, his children, but these are his children by different wives. So it says, uh, it says, and it came to pass after this that Absalom the son of David. Now Absalom's mother was Mary. The son of David, had, and he had a fair sister whose name was Tamar. Could have been, uh, that's, his, that's his sister, meaning they ain't got the same mother. Then it says, and Amnon, the son of David, loved her. So now he, he Amnon had a different mother. Heinolin was his, was, uh, his mother. All right, let's go to verse two. You ready to go ahead? And Abnon was so vexed that he fell sick for his sister Tamar. Uh -huh. She was a virgin, and Abnon thought it hard for him to do anything to her. So now he he said, what well, said that he was vexed, so he's attracted in some kind of way to this to his half sister. Okay, which well, should be going down. But verse uh, where we at? Verse, verse five. five. Thank you. Go ahead. And Jonadab said unto him. Lie thee down on thy bed and make thyself sick. And when our father cometh to see thee, said to him, I pray thee, let my sister Tamar come and give me meat and dress the meat in my sight that I may see it and eat it at her hand. So we didn't read it, but uh, John, 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 dad came unto him and said, Man, what you upset for? You the king? Oh, man, I'm, he, he liked Tamar. He said, Well, I got a plan. So he gives him this wicked, wicked counsel to act like he's sick and then ask Tamar to come in. 
So Amnon lay down and made himself sick. And when the king was come to see him, Amnon said unto the king, I pray thee that Tamar, my sister, come and make me a couple of cakes in my sight that I may eat at her hand. Let's go to verse uh, 10. When you ready, go ahead. And Amnon said unto Tamar, uh -huh. bring the meat into the chamber that I may eat of thine hand. And Tamar took the cakes which he had made and brought them into the chamber to Amnon, her brother. So now, now one thing about it, Tamar doesn't know what, what's going on in this foolish man's mind. She's trying to do the right thing, has no ill intent, is not guilty of doing anything but trying to help somebody who she thinks is sick. So said, and I said unto Tamar, bring the meat into the chamber that I may eat of thine hand. And Tamar took the cakes which she had made and brought them into the chamber to Amon, Amon her brother. See, one thing about this that it points out is that you sometimes you can't uh, you have to take into account sometimes other people's foolishness and protect yourself and understand when you may be vulnerable. That's not fair. But one of the lessons you learn is you keep living. Life is not fair. That's not right. It don't matter. It don't matter. You have to you have to and. And of course, in this case, you're like, man, that's a brother. The mind is a sordid place. The mind is a sordid place. And you have to take into consideration what other people might do when you operate in this world. Particularly a woman, because regard, again, it's not politically correct. But when you look at it, physically, obviously, women are more vulnerable than men. So they are more, they could be more prone to be taken advantage of in this way. You need to understand that when you walk in the streets. I give an example, the woman that was out, she out four o'clock in the morning driving somebody home, and then this racist comes in, she going the wrong way, and then he, he comes into her and he assaults her, pulls a gun at her, totally wrong, 100% wrong. But if it were my daughter, I would tell you, do not go out at four o'clock at night anywhere, or four o'clock in the morning anywhere. If it so be that somebody had to go out at four o'clock in the morning, let it be me. That don't mean what she, that don't mean she was wrong and she did something. That man was totally wrong. So don't, don't, mis, don't misunderstand what I'm saying, but you have to account for the things that may happen and understand when you are vulnerable. People looking at you like prey. You walk around like a little lamb, they looking at you like, like a meal. So you have to take that into consideration. Is that fair? No. That's the reality. That's the reality. So where we at? Verse 11. Thank you. And when she had brought them unto him to eat, he took hold of her and said at her, come lie with me, my sister. Uh -huh. And she answered him, nay, my brother, do not force me for no such thing ought to be done in Israel. Do not do thou this father. So she told him, no. She said, don't do this father. That is father. You're not supposed to be with your half-sister. Verse 13. And I, whither shall I cause my shame to go? And as for thee, thou shalt be as one of the fools in Israel. Mm -hmm. Now, therefore, I pray thee, speak unto the king, for he will not withhold me from thee. So she might be telling him that to get out of there. But is it that he want to, is it he want to be with her and marry her? He love her as he just infatuated with being with her. See, that could be the issue too. And that's a lot of times when you see these issues. See, one thing about it, in general, if a man want to be, if a man truly loved you, what thing he would do? He would marry you. A lot of times, men would tell women anything. But he said, she answered him, nay, my brother, do not force me for no such thing ought to be done in Israel. She was right. Do not this folly. She was right again. And I will with and whether shall I cause my shame to go, being defiled. Right? Because we read earlier in the law about you can't just slander a, a, a one a virgin in Israel and say something because they had an honorable position, and her certainly being the king's daughter. So I pray, she said, I pray thee speak unto the king, but he will not withhold thee, me from thee. So in verse 14, what does it say? How be it, he would not hearken to her voice, but being stronger than she, forced her in line with her. So she was in a vulnerable position, and that's rape. That's rape. Hold, uh, 
And that's a, that's that's good. Let's keep, let's keep going. Fifteen, because that's a cap. I wanted to read what that's a capital punishment. Actually, uh, give me one second. Uh, Deuteronomy twenty second chapter. Just so we understand what he did and how the Lord feel about what he did. Deuteronomy the twenty second chapter, in verse twenty five. Deuteronomy twenty two and verse twenty five. When you ready, go ahead. But if a man find a betrothed dance on the field, and a man force her in line with her, so then now this is not consensual. Just what uh Amnon did to Tamar. But if a man find a betrothed damsel in the field, and a man force her and lie with her, then the man what? Then the man only that lie with her shall die. Go ahead. But until the damsel thou shalt do nothing. Cause why not? There is in the damsel no sin worthy of death. None she did that was wrong. None she did. This man was a perpetrator. Go ahead. For as when a man riseth against his neighbor and slayeth him, even so is this manner. So it's just like if a man, you know, lying and wait to kill somebody, take, take somebody by surprise. Take somebody by surprise. I always think of, I don't understand today. Again, it's not politically correct, but it is what it is. I don't understand why women are operating in the way that they operate today when when people behave in which they behave. When I drive to work, I see little, little girls walking around wooded areas with all the missing young black girls around here. Your parents don't have sense enough to not let you walk by this wooded area with all these cars passing by where somebody could just snatch you up. When we was coming here today, I saw a woman in my periphery. She was by herself in one, next to a big uh, a dumpster just sitting. Wait, that's not, you shouldn't be, you know, can't nobody really see you. You have to protect yourself. You have to keep in mind what other people will do. That don't make sense to me. And ain't nobody, and that's the bad part. Something happened to you, they not going to find you. They not coming to look for you. Black life is cheap in this country. But now back to uh, 2 Samuel. Where were we at? Verse 16? 2 Samuel uh, 13 chapter. Verse, verse 15, thank you. So he, he raped her, he raped her, verse uh, 15. Then Amon hated her exceedingly. Now, wait a minute, now he done laid with her. First, he, he was sick for her. Now he didn't do what he wanted to do. Now he hated her. Go ahead. So that the hatred where with he hated her was greater than the love with which he had loved her. Uh -huh. And Amon said her to arise, be gone. And that's because what he was trying to get was totally carnal. It could be like that in consensual relationships, too. You've seen that. You lay with somebody, have no covenant, no relate, not even no relationship. And you lay in that in like, oh, so uh, when are you getting out of here? It's about time for you to go. Because they didn't got what they wanted. They didn't treat you like trash. They throw you away. See, you got to have some self-value. You're not trash. Have some dignity, have some respect. Don't let nobody do you like that. You looking at you like, man, when are you getting out of here? What do you call your Uber? How you gonna get home? He go to sleep. What we at? Verse 17? Verse 16. 16, thank you. And she said unto him, There is no cause this evil in sending me away is greater than the other that thou didst unto me. But he would not hearken unto her. So now he just totally did this uh, terrible thing to Tamar. In verse 17. Then he called his servant and ministered unto him and said, Put now this woman out from me and bolt the door after Man, her. get her out of here and lock the door. So he was totally bogus. Now skip down to verse 19, if you will. So what was Tamar's uh, situation after this? Go ahead. And Tamar put ashes on her head and ran a garment of diverse colors that were on her and laid her head on her head and went on crying. So now it says she put ashes on her head and she was in mourning and ran her garments of diverse colors that was upon her and laid her hand on her head and went on crying. And her brother Absalom sees this. Ironically, Absalom means peace. But well, go ahead. What did it say about? What did he say? Verse twenty. Uh -huh. And Absalom, her brother, said unto her, "Had Abner thy brother been with thee, uh -huh. but hold now thy peace, my sister, for he is thy brother. Regard not this thing." So Tamar remained desolate in her brother's Absalom's house. So now that was des desolate because she was not a virgin. So now she's in her brother's house. 
Not a verse. See, it, again, all this was going on right now with the sexual debauchery, that was not the case back here. I mean, obviously, certain cases did take place, but the expectation was that women were to be virgins. So now she was in a state of defilement. So now she remained in her brother's house. Let's skip down to verse uh, three. Thank you, 22. When you ready, go ahead. And Absalom spake unto his brother, Abnon, neither good nor bad. Absalom hated Abnon because he had forced his sister to Tamar. So now he didn't say anything, good or bad. He just lay low, waiting for an opportunity for what to get get some payback for what for what Abnon did to his sister. Now let's skip to verse uh, twenty eight because the time came. Go ahead. Now Absalom had commanded the servant saying. Mark ye now when Abnon's heart is merry with wine. Uh -huh. And when I say unto you, smite Abnon, then kill him. Fear not, have not I commanded you, be courageous and be thou. So now he, Absalom told his servants, he said, listen, when Ab uh, Ab told him, when Abnon get drunk, I'm gonna give you the, <laughs> I'm gonna give you the, uh, the signal and you smite Abnon, kill him. Don't worry about nothing. And that happened. So what, what was this a consequence of, again, the Lord told David what he was going to allow to happen within his own household. Swart is not going to depart. So now you got your two sons fighting, one killing, one, one rape your daughter. Now let's skip to uh, Second Samuel 16. Second Samuel, thank you. Second Samuel 16. And verse 9, because now What's happened is that David is on the run. Now he's being chased to be killed by his own son, Absalom. Absalom, the part that he, he comes and he's now he's he's got this, this beef with David. And so he's gonna try to kill his own father. This is 2 Samuel, the 16th chapter, and verse 9. When you ready, go ahead. Then said Abisha, the son of Zeruah, unto the king, mm -hmm. Why should this dead dog curse my lord, the king? Go ahead. Let me go about pray thee and take off his head. Mm -hmm. And the king said, What have I to do with you, ye sons of Zeruah? So let him curse, because the Lord has said unto him, Curse David. Mm -hmm. Who shall then say, Wherefore hast thou done so? So he's you talking about Shimei. He's talking about when Shimei was cursing him. He said, Man, let me, what is service? He said, Man, let me, what is this? Let me go kill him for talking about the king like that. He said, Man, God allow him to curse me. Let him curse. I'm not thinking about that. What was he thinking about? Go ahead. And David said to Abisha and to his, all the servants, uh -huh. Behold, my son which came forth out of my bowels, seeking my life. I'm not worried about this man right now talking that, talking that stuff. My own son trying to kill me right now. That's what I'm worried about. But all that got put, in the, put into motion, and the Lord allowed that to happen because of what he did with you, Ryan's wife. Well, go ahead, please. How much more now may this Benjamite do it? Uh -huh. Let him alone and let him curse, for the Lord has been here. He said, let him alone and let him curse. Go ahead. It may be that the Lord will look on my affliction and that the Lord will requite me good for this cursing this day. Maybe the Lord will look upon this and requite me some good down the line. Maybe he'll do that. Let's keep going. Verse 13. And as David and his men went by the way, Shimei went along on the hillside over against him and cursed as he went and threw stones at him and cast dust. And the king and all the people that were with him came weary and refreshed themselves there. Can you take fire into your bosom and not be burned? Understand, David was the greatest king Israel ever had. But this is one thing that's not why we still think about what he did to you. We hear, we know he we know he gonna be resurrected, but this is one thing that we looking at even until this day and saying, Man, that was wrong. That's shame. See, you want to avoid shame, you want to avoid. Doing that which will bring harm to you and your and your family. And a lot of times when you look at when you look at the, dis, the, the, the dismembered houses, households that you see, when you got kids growing up and broken homes, all those homes were established a lot of times with illicit sexual behavior. Illicit sexual behavior. Where are we at? Verse 20. Verse 20. When you go ahead. Then said Absalom to a hither field. Uh -huh. Give counsel among you what we shall do. So now Absalom is entering into Jerusalem and he wants to establish himself as the as Saul. 
as the sovereign king. So now he goes to get counsel. And what is what is Ahithophel tell? And Ahithophel said unto Absalom, Go unto thy father's concubines, which he had left to keep the house. And all Israel shall hear that thou art a board of thy father. Then shall the hands of all that are with thee be strong. Now we, we read earlier in the 12th uh, chapter of 2 Samuel that, hey, of your one of your own house, well, your, your name is going to go into, into your wives and going to lay before them before the sun. So now Hithophel gives Absalom the counsel, then go into your into your uh your father's wives, those his concubines, which he had left to keep the house. That house that he was on top of looking out. Now you got your son taking your wives. Why? Because that was a way again, of, that's how they show who was in charge. Just like he told him, I gave you Saul's wife. And now somebody gonna take yours. It says, and Hephaestus said unto Absalom, Go in unto thy father's concubines, which he hath left to keep the house, and all Israel shall hear that thou art abhorred or hated of thy father. Then shall the hands of all that are with thee be strong. Right? So you that's something you weren't supposed to do. That's that violates Torah. That's what Reuben did to Jacob when he took his concubine. It says, So they spread Absalom a tent upon the house. On the top of the house, and what happened? And Absalom went into his father's concubines in the sight of all Israel. So all Israel see it. They said, "Oh, first, uh, oh yeah, now that was it. That was it. Thank you." Genesis thirty-nine. Now we're in Genesis thirty-nine. Genesis thirty-nine, and we're gonna see the example of Joseph and what happened to him. Genesis the thirty-ninth chapter. And verse 1. Genesis 39 and verse 1. Because here, Joseph is in captivity in Egypt. He was brought by Potiphar. And he rose to prominence amongst <laughs> Potiphar because he was a benefit unto him. This is Genesis 39. We're going to see what happened to him. Genesis 31 and verse 1. Are you ready to go ahead? And Joseph was brought down to Egypt. And Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, Brought him on the hands of the Israelites, which had brought him down thither. His brethren that were first gonna kill him, sold him to some Israelites. They took him and sold him uh, in Egypt unto Potiphar. Go ahead, verse two. And the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man. Uh huh. And he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. Uh huh. And Joseph found grace in his sight, and he served him. And he made him overseer over his house and all that he put in his hand. So now Joseph, again, this man's benefit from Joseph. The Lord is with Joseph, so whatever he touches is prosper. So now it says in verse 5, And it came to pass from the time that he had made him overseer in his house and over all that he had. And the Lord blessed the Egyptians' house of Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was upon all that he had in the house and in the field. I'm in verse 6 now. It says, And he left all that he had in Joseph's hand. And he knew not all he had, save the bread which he did eat. And Joseph was a goodly person and well favored. So he didn't have to worry about nothing because he had Joseph. So he, he said, oh, I'm not worried about what I'm about to eat because I know everything else is taken care of. In verse 7, what does it say? And he gave him the pass of these things. That his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph, and she said, lie with me. Now, it said something about Joseph. It said he was a goodly person. That means handsome. So now Joseph was handsome and popular. So now he didn't caught the eye of Fer uh, Potiphar's wife. And it says, and it came to pass after these things that the, his master's wife, that's talking about Potiphar's wife, cast her eyes upon Joseph, and she said, lie with me. Verse 8. But he refused and said unto his master's wife. But Joseph wasn't trying to go that way. He refused and said unto his master's wife, what? Behold, my master, what is not what is with me in the house. Uh huh. And he had committed all that he had into my hand. He said, listen, the, the, my master has given me everything, committed every. I got control over all this. Go ahead. There is none greater in this house than I. I I'm, I'm none, nobody in this house is greater than I. Neither have he kept back anything from me, but what? But thee. But thee. You're the only thing he didn't kept back from me. Because what? Because thou art his wife. Because you his wife. So he asked the question. Go ahead. 
How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? See, so, so how can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Because that's adultery. Even back here, it's adultery. It's a sin against God. So he said, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Verse 10, it mm -hmm. says, and it came to pass as she spake to Joseph day by day that he hearkened not unto her to lie about her or to be with her. So day by day, he's in a, he's in a compromising situation. Because this woman does have power because that's part of his wife. But he's steady refusing. Verse 11. And it came to pass about this time that Joseph went into the house to do his business. Uh -huh. And there was none of the man of the house there with uh, within. So he went in the house. Now Joseph is, Joseph is a man. And he in a vulnerable position. Just like Tamar was in a vulnerable position. Joseph go in and ain't nobody around. But this woman in the house keep trying to lie with him. But now ain't nobody around. It wasn't Joseph's fault. Of course it wasn't Joseph's fault. And eventually this led to Israel uh, being saved in the long run. But it just to keep something in our mind about how we, even as men, how we conduct ourselves. So it says it came to pass about this time that Joseph went into the house to do his business. Nothing wrong with that. It said, and there was none of the men of the house there within. So nobody around, but what happened? Verse 12. And she called him by his garment saying, lie with me. So, but she called him by his garment and saying, lie with me. Go ahead, what did he do? And he left his garment in her hand and fled and got him out. He, he left his garment in her hand and fled and got him out. He said, I'm out of here. But what did she do? She lied on him. She had the garment in her hand and said, and made false accusations and said, he did this. He tried, to, he tried to assault me and left this. And then he was thrown in prison. Why am I saying that now? Because look at what's going on right now. All it takes is an accusation for your career. You're a man for your career to be over. Now, I'm not saying in every case that didn't happen, but it's certainly case uh, that it did, that it did happen. It's certainly cases where it didn't happen. So you have to keep in mind if you are in a vulnerable position. You don't want even a perception of evil. People were making fun of the vice president. He said, I don't have meetings with other women unless my wife is in the room. People were making fun of him and mocking him. I think that's wise to do. I think that's wise to do. I was at work and uh, uh, one, somebody came and <laughs> a supervisor, a boss, they said they, said they want to talk to me. They was coming in with my area. I said, no, we can do it right here. You can step out where everybody can see. It looked at me like I was crazy. I, hey, I'm not, you're not trying, I'm not trying to be in no trick bag. But verse, uh, let's go to, uh, let's go to Job. Because see, just like tomorrow we're trying to do anything, Joseph wasn't trying to do anything either. You have to keep in mind what other people might do. That's one of the hard things to explain to young people. Let me turn your mic off and turn it back on and see if that helps. That's a hard thing to, to explain to, uh, to young people. They want to go out and do different things. I'm not going out to do anything, but you can't account for somebody else that's trying to assault you. You can't account for somebody else that's trying to slip something into your drink. And you out there again, like a little lamb, ain't paying no attention. And the wolf out there. Job the 31st chapter, we're going to pick it up at verse 1. Because adultery is something that the Lord doesn't want us to engage in. Again, he said, you got your own sister. And Job when he's, he's talking about himself and trying to justify himself, he says something about his own mindset. This is the same one who <clears throat> made sacrifices for his sons just in case they may have cursed God's in their mind. He did that continually. Let's see what he says about his way of thought. Uh, Job 31 and verse 1. When you ready, go ahead. I made a covenant with my eye. Uh -huh. Why then shall I think upon a maid? He made a covenant or an agreement with his own eyes. He said, why then should I look upon a maid? What is he talking about? He's talking about somebody else's wife. I'm not even, he didn't say I'm not going to commit adultery. He said, I'm not even going to be looking to lust after her. And then he says, verse two, what did he say? 
Who, what portion of God is there from above? Uh -huh. and what inheritance of the Almighty from on high? Uh -huh. It's not destruction to the wicked and the strange punishment to the workers of iniquity. Isn't that what I'm a gift for doing if I do that? Right? Let's skip down to verse uh, 9. What did he say? If my heart had been deceived by a woman. See, he's justifying himself, though. But he said, if my heart has been deceived by a woman. Go ahead. Or if I have laid wait at my neighbor's door. Or if I have laid wait at my neighbor's door, I meaning trying to get at his woman. Go ahead. Then let my wife grind upon another and let others bow down upon her. He said, if I've done that, then let others do that to my wife. He said, I haven't done that. I have made an agreement with my eyes that I'm not even going to look upon a woman to lust after her. Let's go to Matthew the fifth chapter because the, the Lord puts forth the same, the same type of thinking here. Showing us how we should think. And David was on the rooftop when he heard I was somebody else's wife. Oh, I can't do that. Or well, if you know that's somebody else's wife, you can't be lusting after somebody else's wife because, brothers and sisters, right here is where the battle was won and lost. It's up here in the mind. And the sort of place which is the mind, all these, these acts, fornication, adultery, murder, all of them, you had to think about that first. And then it manifests itself through your actions. So you have to control what you think about. And here, this is what the Lord tells us. This is Matthew, the fifth chapter, and verse 27. Matthew 5 and 27. When you ready, go ahead. You have heard that it was said by them of old time, uh -huh. thou shalt not commit adultery. You read that in Exodus chapter 20. You read it. We said, thou shalt not commit adultery. That's in the law. That's one of the Ten Commandments. Well, what did he say? Is he, is he loosening the reins? On the law, what do he say? But I say unto you, uh -huh. that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her have committed adultery with her already in his heart. He said, but I'm telling you, he who hath looked upon a woman to lust after her to commit adultery, or to look upon a woman to lust after her have committed adultery with her already in his heart. He's talking about somebody else's wife. That's what he's talking about. And you shouldn't do that because, again, you keep thinking about that, keep thinking about that, keep thinking about that, and then you mess around and you get an opportunity to do that. Now you didn't commit an adultery. But if you reject in the thought, you're not going to do the action. That's why you have to change our way of thinking. Um, let's go back to Job. I should have told you to hold your finger in Job. And let's go to, uh, to 24. Job is 24 chapter. Because we want to look at a class of people here that Job describes in the 24th chapter. This is Job, the 24th chapter. And he's talking about the wicked. And let's see this class of people here. Job 24, we're going to pick it up at verse 13. When you ready, go ahead. There are those that rebelled against the light. Uh -huh. They know not the ways that are up, nor abide in the paths that are up. So they, he, he talking about the wicked. He said they, they are those that rebel. It's like God seems almost indifferent, but he got those that rebel against the light. They know not the ways thereof, nor abide in the past thereof. Go ahead. The murderer rising with the light killeth the poor and needy, and in the night is as a thief. So in their own darkness, in spiritual darkness, and just ignorance of how to, to, uh, to operate and behave in the literal darkness, it said a murderer rising with the light killeth the poor and needy, and the night in the night is as a thief. So you got the murderer and you got the thief. Who else you got? Verse 15. Mm -hmm. The eye also of the adulterer waited for the twilight. You season. got the one that's waiting at his at his at his neighbor's door. You got the adulterer. The eye also of the adulterer. He waited for the twilight saying what? Nobody shall see me and disguise his face. Nobody gonna see me. I was talking about coming out to Motel 6. Nobody gonna see me coming out here. He puts all them together, the murderer, the thief, and the adulterer. The eye also of the adulterer waited for the twilight, saying, No eye shall see me, and disguising his face. That's what he does. Verse 15. Verse 16. 16, thank you. In the dark they dig through houses, which they have marked for themselves in the daytime. Uh -huh. They know not the light. Go ahead. For the morning is to them even as the shadow of death. If one know them, they're in the terrors of the shadow of death. They're doing all their stuff in the dark. Again, one thing about it, he put them all together, thief, murder, and adultery. But one thing about it, it'll come to light. It will come to light. Let's go to uh, New Testament, 1 Corinthians. Let's look at another 
another class of people. First Corinthians. The seventh chapter, first Corinthians, the seventh chapter. And we're going to pick it up in verse one. First Corinthians seven and one. We ready to go ahead. All right. First Corinthians seven and one. We ready to go ahead. Now concerning the things whereof ye wrote unto me. It is good for a man not to touch a woman. So now this is Paul here. He's talking. He's saying it's good for a man not to touch a woman. But as Jesus tells us, everybody ain't got that gift. What he's talking about is being a self-made eunuch for the kingdom of, kingdom of God's sake. That's what Paul was. Paul didn't have a wife. He was dealing with the word of God. He's establishing churches throughout, throughout Europe and Asia. He's doing the work of the Lord, spreading the gospel. He said, I, he, so he says it's good not to have a wife, but clearly everybody can't do that. He said, now concerning the things where uh, we, you, you wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a wife. That's not law. Okay? So but you can be celibate, but everybody can't do that. And he says something here in verse 2. Verse 2. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife. Let every woman have her own husband. He said, nevertheless, avoid fornication because that's what will happen if you can't, if you can't uh, sustain, uh, uh, discipline yourself in that regard. He said to avoid fornication or pornea. What's that? That's the Greek word pornea. That's where fornication comes from. It's illicit sexual behavior. And that's a large umbrella. A lot of things fall under that umbrella. You're talking about adultery. You're talking about just having sex with people not married. All homosexuality, all that for all that's fornication. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let it say, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. So here we see another class, fornicators. In general, it's just talking about people not, who are not in a, in a marital union having sex. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. It go right back. To being married. Go right back to the institution that he made in the beginning. Verse 3. That the husband render unto the wife to benevolence. Uh -huh. And likewise also the wife unto the husband. So we didn't say do, give her her due. Let the husband render unto the wife her due. And likewise also the wife unto the husband. So whatever you do unto your wife, meaning do what you owe, give it, and vice versa. Then it says, verse 4, go ahead. The wife have not power of her own body, but, it but said, the husband. But it said, a wife have not power of her own body, but the husband. And what? And likewise, also the husband have not power of his own body, but the wife. So, he, so understand, when it comes to sexual intimacy, he said, a wife have not power of her own body, but the husband, and, and vice versa. And likewise, also the husband have not power of his own body, but the wife. Then he says something. What shouldn't you do? Verse 5. Defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time. So he said, refrain. Now we read what Solomon was like, always be ravished with the wife, with your wife's love, right? But it said, defraud ye not one another. So Paul is telling you a similar thing. He said, man, don't refrain from uh, sexual intimacy from your spouse, except it be with consent for a time. Don't continue to, don't do that. He said that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer. So maybe y'all fasting and prayer, maybe y'all focusing on the Lord, that's fine to do it then, but don't continue to do that. Because what can happen? It come together that Satan tempt ye not for your incontinence. So he said y'all better come together again that Satan tempt you not for your incontinence or your lack of self-control. You see that uh, oftentimes, you see it more so with women than men, that women will try to control a man by, by depriving him of sex. That's what they would do. Oh, you don't want to do this? Well, you ain't getting any. You don't want to do this or you're going to be on the couch. Because I don't understand how a man on the couch in his own house. But nevertheless, you see that. Like I tell the story of my, my family member, that happened to him. He was married. His, she moved her mother in, got to meddling into their situation. You want to control him? Don't give him any. That was the advice that she gave. It went years that they weren't intimate. 
He wasn't intimate with her. He certainly was intimate with somebody else, though, while they was married. And that marriage is all. You shouldn't do that. Because the reality is, is that we are sexual creatures. That's the reality. We all sitting here. Somebody was doing something. We all got here. Somebody did something. So that shows you we sexual creatures. But it's supposed to be within the confines of marriage. And within those marriages, you don't want to deprive somebody of something that you know, that they, quite frankly, need. That's what it is. We were built in a certain way. And we were built that way so that we can fulfill that mandate, be fruitful and multiply. But it says, that's, but uh, we are verse 6. Verse 6. Thank you. But I speak this by permission, mm -hmm. not a commandment. Go ahead. I would that all men were even as I myself. That's not a commandment. That's permission. He said, man, be like me. Be like me. You know, no wife. But I speak this by permission and not a commandment. For I would that all men were even as I myself. But he said, what? But every man had his proper gift of God. <laughs> every man got his proper gift of God. <laughs> everybody don't have that gift. You see them Catholic priests? Everybody don't have that gift. We celebrate, but they sleep with the nuns, they sleep with the kids, they're doing all kind of stuff. Why? Because you weren't supposed to do that. That's not, for, first of all, obviously the religion is, is bogus and false, but you're not supposed to be just, be. everybody can't do that, just be celibate. No. Every man had this proper gift of God, one after this matter and another after that. Verse 8. I said, therefore, to the unmarried and widows. It is good for them if they abide even as I. So the unmarried and the unmarried uh, virgins and the widows indeed is good if you abide even as I, if you be so. That's good. But what? But if they cannot contain. Meaning if you can't, if you can't contain, what should you do? Let them marry. Why? It is better to marry than to burn. It'd be better for you to get married than to burn in hell. Because marriage is honorable. That's honorable. He said, but if they can't cannot contain, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn. Let's go right into the sixth chapter of First Corinthians. And here we'll see how fornication, in general, how that's a different type of sin than other sins. This is us, First Corinthians, the sixth chapter and verse 13. So we should understand that we shouldn't be engaged in that. If we're the people of God, we shouldn't be engaged. Now, this first Corinthians, the sixth chapter, and verse 13. We ready to go ahead. Meats for the belly and the belly for meat. Uh huh. But God shall destroy both it and them. Now, the body is not for fornication. So, go ahead. So, he said the body is not for fornication. See, your carnal nature might be telling you that, but then we should understand that's what's in us so that we will reproduce again within the confines of marriage. He said, Your body is not for fornication, though. But it's what, for what? But for the Lord and the Lord for the body. He said, but for the Lord. Verse 14. And God had both raised up the Lord and will also raise up us by his own power. What does he tell us about our bodies? Go ahead. Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ. Don't you know that you are connected with Christ? How you fornicate and you connected with the Lord? That don't go together. That don't go together. Just like it, it, certain things just don't go together. A righteous mindset with an unrighteous apparel don't go together. That don't go together. And it's not even about somebody else. It's about you and how you value yourself and your connection with God and the message that you are telling the world about yourself. So he said, no, you not that the, your bodies are the members of Christ. Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of an harlot? God forbid. So how in the world are you talking about you with Christ, but then you're going to go sleep with a harlot? Do that make any sense? You got the spirit of God dwelling in you? That's a contradiction. They are antithetical to one another. Shall I, he said this, shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of an harlot? God forbid. Verse 16. What? Do you not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body? He, how you, you become one with a harlot. How you become one with a harlot? Because y'all become one through sexual intercourse. He 
said, what? No, you're not that he which is joined to an heart in his one body. For two said he shall be one flesh. When did he say that? He said that in Genesis 2. But who did he say you were supposed to be uh, one with? It wasn't a prostitute. It wasn't a harlot. It wasn't a whorish woman. It wasn't somebody else's wife. With your wife. Well, no, you're not that he which is joined to an heart in his one body, for two said he shall be one flesh. Verse 17. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit. So what must we do? Go ahead. Flee fornication. You got to flee fornication. Go ahead. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body. So all the sins, if you steal somebody's wallet, you doing that's outside your body. Right? You even kill somebody. That's outside your own body. Flee for the case. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body or outside. That's what he's saying. Outside the body. But what? But he that committed fornication sinneth against his own body. You literally sinned against your own body. You commit adultery when you fornicate in general. You sinned against your own soul. Now, let's, we're in 1 Corinthians, the fifth chapter. And that's another thing. When you see it amongst. You got something else? First thing. Oh, yeah, thank you. Verse 19. Thank you very much. Go ahead. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you? Thank you. Don't you know what you are? You are dwelling for the temple. You are dwelling for the Holy Ghost. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? Holy Ghost did it with your mind. It said, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. You're not your own. Just like a man who wanted to to uh, marry a woman, he had to come with a dowry. He might come with a bride price. Verse 20. For he had bought with a price. He bought you with a price. What he do? He shed his blood. He shed his blood so, so that we would have an opportunity to be saved. So once we come up under his blood, once we are baptized and come up a new creature, we got to walk in the right way. We can't do the things we used to do. You know, y'all, some of y'all was out there, but I'm talking about me. Let me talk about me. I was out there bogus. <laughs> out there bogus. You can't do that anymore. What? No, you're not that your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own, for ye are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You belong to Him. Like Paul would say, I'm a slave to Christ. So I'm one with him. I'm one with the Messiah. He who was without sin. But then I'm going to go and deal with a heart. It shouldn't be. First Corinthians, the fifth chapter. And one thing about it, like I said earlier, many of us are coming into this truth later on in life. Just like the people who Paul was talking to at the congregation, in the congregation of Corinth. He's talking to people who had a whole different culture. And who had a whole different lifestyle It's not just you ought to make your mind go blank When you come up out of that water And you just You just <laughs> you remember all the stuff you used to do It takes time to get out of that stuff That's why it's easy and better If you would come up as a child And not deal with these things Because it's a whole lot of things Just like you get a bunch of bad doctrine going up You got to wash all that doctrine off Before you can even deal with the truth You've been out here doing, dealing with all kind of illicit sexual behavior. That's, a, that's something you got to get over. And that's not easy. First Corinthians, the fifth chapter, in verse one. And when you see it in the church, you're not supposed to be quiet. When you see it in the congregation, you're not supposed to be quiet about it. And the, and the congregation shouldn't look like the world. We shouldn't be doing the same thing the world is doing. What's the point? We might as well go back in the world. 1 Corinthians, the fifth chapter, and verse 1. We ready to go ahead. It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you. So now he, right, he pins his letter. He said, listen, it's reported commonly. Generally, I mean, it's going on that it's fornication among you. And what? And such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles. Uh-huh. That one should have his father's wife. It's fornication going on that one should even have his father's wife. So he's dealing with his stepmom. That's what he's talking about. He said, man, y'all a bunch of fornicators. And you got even a man dealing with his own stepmother. What are you telling them about themselves? Go ahead. And you have puffed up and is not rather mourned that he that had done this deed might be taken away from among you. He said, you puffed up and have not rather mourned. You are indifferent to evil. 
You cannot be indifferent to evil. You have to call out evil. That's the man of God, because this is pastor, preacher, teacher. That's his job to tell you, to warn you, so you're not destroyed in your sin. And ye are puffed up and have not rather mourn that he that have done this deed might be taken away from among you. In the old days, they were stoned. You got to address sin. Verse 3. For I verily is absent in body, but present in spirit, have judged already. What? He judged? Already. Already. <laughs> That's what people say. You can't, you know, brother, you're not supposed to do that. Sister, you're not supposed to do that. You can't judge me. I call that the Tupac doctrine. Only God can judge me. No, I can tell you what thus saith the Lord. For I verily is absent in body, but present in spirit. I'm not there, but I heard what happened. And I took that and applied it and compared it to what God said you should do and have judged. He said, for I barely as absent in body, but present in spirit have judged already as though I were present, as if I was there in the flesh concerning him that has so done this, this deed. I'm going to tell you about him. I've judged him already. Verse 4. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, uh -huh. when you are gathered together and my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ uh -huh. to deliver such as one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. You got to deliver one such and one unto Satan for the destruction. You got to cast him out. Sometimes people can be restored. Other times you got to show them the door. Why? Because if you don't, you are giving a message to the rest of the people. What's the message? Oh, I can do it too. I work with kids. Be with some kids and one doing something and you don't address it. Then another doing something, you know, you, and you talk to him. He said, but you let him do it. Why are you talking to me? He getting away with it. You got to address it. You got to address it and can't be scared to address it. Hurt somebody feelings? Oh, well. Or some people might leave? Oh, well, get out. <laughs> Go. But we want a big crowd, man. I, I want to be saved. <laughs> that's what I want. That's why it's not, it's not a smooth message. It's a much smoother message to say the Lord loves you. You can do whatever you want to do. Just believe on him. It'll be all right. And that's that's what they that's no standard at all. You got to have a standard. You got to have a standard. Let's skip down to verse uh yeah. thank you, verse nine. Because what did he tell him? Go ahead. I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators. Now, I told you not to company with fornicators. Now, is he talking about in the church? Go ahead. Yeah, not all together with the fornicators of, fornicators of this world, or with the covetous or extortioners or with the idolaters, but then must ye needs go out of the world. So he's telling you, I'm not talking about outside the world because you're surrounded by fornicators. You're on your job surrounded by people who are doing all kind of illicit things. All kind of sin. That's that's you say you get rid of them. You got to go outside the world. You got to leave the planet. You don't want to be around some people that sin. You better get on a spaceship when you gonna go to Mars. Because when people get there, they're gonna be sinning. <laughs> you if you leave this, if you leave this uh planet and go to Mars, if you could do that, and some people follow you, you got sin. Because you got people there. So I, I wrote unto you in an epistle or letter not to company with fornicators. Verse 11. But now I've written unto you not to keep company of any man that is called a brother, uh -huh. be a fornicator, or covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or extortioner, which such as one no, not to eat. So he's telling you, you can't, you can't, that shouldn't be going on within the congregation. And again, as I stated earlier, it's, it's time you can restore people. But one thing about it, you can't just allow things to continue, continue on. And the man sleep with his stepmother. Everybody know, ain't nobody said nothing. And you know what's going on? No, that shouldn't be. Verse 12. But what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within? Judgment start at the house of the Lord. You got to start within. That's just like us. We have to start with our, before we start talking about looking, even at the world, really we should look at what we're doing. We should look at ourselves. He said, well, what have I to judge them that I was out? So I'm judging those that don't, that ain't following the gospel and not judging those that's within. But then that are without God judges. I'm going to leave that to the Lord. Therefore, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. Put away from among yourselves that wicked person. Let's go to uh, Leviticus. 
because he set them apart. He's telling they should be dealing in fornication. Now the law also set Israel apart and tells them all types of behavior, sexual behavior that they shouldn't be engaged in. Leviticus 11 chapter, 18 chapter. Leviticus the 18th chapter, we're gonna pick it up at verse uh verse one. Because he tells you earlier, you can't be like the world. Well, when he brought Israel out of bondage, he told them a similar thing. You can't be like the world. You can't be like these other people. Leviticus 18, chapter, verse 1. We ready? Go ahead. And the Lord speaking to Moses, saying, uh -huh. speaking to the children of Israel and saying to them, Go ahead. I am the Lord your God. After the doing of the land of Egypt, wherein ye dwell, shall ye not do. You can't do what everybody else is doing. You look out in the world, everything that's going on, everything people do, we can't be like them. Why? Because he brought us with a price. We belong to him. He says, after the doings of the land of Egypt, wherein ye dwelt, shall ye not do it. After the doings of, of the land of Canaan, whither I bring you, shall ye not do. Neither shall ye walk in their ordinances. Verse 6. When you ready to go ahead, because now he's going to tell you about all the sexual behavior that you cannot engage in. The bit is 18 and 6. When you ready to go ahead. None of you should approach any that is near kin to him. So you can't, don't approach anybody that's related to you. Close. He said, near of kin. That's close relatives. To, to do what? To uncover the nakedness. I am the Lord. He said, I'm the Lord. Go ahead. The nakedness of thy father, the nakedness of thy mother. Shall thou not uncover? Right, so he said, don't uncover the necklace of your father and your mother. Dealing the incest, he said, go ahead, verse. Oh, the end of that verse. She is thy mother. Thou shalt not uncover her nakedness. Go ahead. The nakedness of thy father's wife shall thou not uncover. It is thy father's nakedness. So he said, the nakedness of thy father's wife. Again, that's what Reuben did. That's what Absalom did. Said naked. The nakedness of thy father's wife. That's what the man of 1 Corinthians uh did. You're not supposed to do that. It is thy father's nakedness. Verse 9. The nakedness of thy sister, the daughter of thy father, or daughter of thy mother, whether she be born at home or born, born abroad, even that nakedness thou shalt not uncover. You're not supposed to deal with your sister, period. Go ahead. The nakedness of thy son's daughter, or of thy daughter's daughter, even that nakedness thou shalt not uncover. For theirs is thine own nakedness. You're not supposed to deal with your daughter-in-law. It said, nakedness of thy son's daughter, the da or thy daughter's daughter, even uh, their nakedness shall thou not uncover. Verse 11. The nakedness of thy father's wife's daughter, begotten of thy father, she is thy sister. Thou shalt not uncover her nakedness. You're not supposed to do that either. Go ahead. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy father's sister. She is thy father's near kinswoman. You're not supposed to be dealing with your auntie. Go ahead. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy mother's sister, for she is thy mother's near kinswoman. Uh huh. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy father's brother. Thou shalt not approach to his wife. She is thine aunt. Not supposed to deal with your. He said, "Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy father's brother." That's your uncle. He said, "No, so you approach his wife. That's your aunt. Also, even though." They married into the family. Still, your aunt. Go ahead. That's and that's his nakedness. But go ahead. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy daughter-in-law. She is thy son's wife. Thou shalt not uncover her nakedness. Uh huh. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy brother's wife. It is thy brother's nakedness. You want to be dealing with your brother's brother's wife while he's alive, because you know you got the liberate law. But other than that, you're not supposed to be doing that. Verse seventeen. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of a woman and her daughter. Neither shall thou take her son's daughter or her daughter's daughter to uncover her nakedness. For they are her near kinswoman. It is wicked. So you weren't supposed to take a woman and her daughter together? You're not supposed to do that? Neither shall thou take her son's daughter or her daughter's daughter? Verse 18. Neither shall thou take a wife to her sister to vex her. Shouldn't take two sisters? Go ahead. To uncover her nakedness. Besides the other in her lifetime. That's why I mentioned that lever right or that duty of brothers in her, I say, in her lifetime. Verse uh, 19. Also, thou should not approach into a woman to uncover her nakedness as long as she is put apart from her unclean. So even when it's talking about a woman that's even that's your wife, you're not supposed to be dealing with her when she's in her menstrual. You're not supposed to do that. Uh where we at? Verse 23. Thank you. 
He has to tell his man everything. We ready to go ahead. None of this shall not lie with any beast to defile thyself therewith. You got to tell this man everything. Neither shalt thou lie with any beast to defile thyself therewith. Not supposed to lay with an animal. They got, you look at first of Europe, they got brothels with animals. Neither shalt thou lie with any beast to defile thyself therewith. Neither what? Neither shall any woman stand before a beast to lie down therewith. It is confusing. It is confusing. And then when both of them do it, the beast got to die and you got to die. Verse 24. Defile not ye yourselves in any of these things. Uh-huh. Put all these things and nations are defiled, which I cast out before you. All these nations were doing these things. That's why they got cast out of the land in the first place. That's why they got kicked out in the first place. He said another one, though. Verse 22. Thou should not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is it what? Is it is an abomination. It is abomination for a man to lie with another man like he lying with a woman. But you that's supposed to be celebrated today. You at the gay pride parade with a little boy celebrating that. That's nothing to celebrate. And people just looking at it like they people lost their mind. They scared to say something about it. Well, hey me, you do you. Yeah, that's true. But at the same time, you shouldn't be sitting there saying it's right. Oh, he's supporting. You shouldn't be supporting nobody 11 years old in heterosexual or homosexual sex. They shouldn't be doing nothing. You better read a book. People have lost their minds. Deuteronomy in the 23rd chapter. At the gay pride parade. Smiling. Got the nerve to take a picture. You ought to be ashamed. You're taking pictures. You ought to be ashamed. People say that's homophobic. You know what that is? That's, that's ad hominem. That's just the words you use, like anti-Semitic. When somebody critiques your, to critique, critiques your behavior, it's an abomination. It was abomination yesterday. It's abomination today. It's going to be an abomination tomorrow. I don't care what the world say. Deuteronomy, the 23rd chapter, verse 17. What the Lord say? When you ready, go ahead. There shall be no whore of the daughters of Israel. See, he didn't want any whores amongst the daughters of Israel or what? Nor Sodomite of the sons of Israel. Nor Sodomites are the sons of Israel. But that's what you got when you look at our people. That's what you got. You got a bunch of whores, whoremongers, and Sodomites. Lesbians. That's what you got. That's what you got. But he said, there shall be no whore of the daughters of Israel. Nor a Sodomite of the sons of Israel. People think it's a big difference between being a prostitute and somebody taking you to dinner and sleeping with you. There ain't no big difference. You done prostituted yourself. You look at her on the street, you leaving McDonald's, going to somebody's house, same thing. Deuteronomy 22nd chapter. So he didn't want this. No sodomy. Let's, let's see something else here. Uh, we're going to read one verse here, verse 5. Deuteronomy 22 and 5. When you ready, go ahead. The woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man. Uh -huh. Neither shall a man put on a woman's garment. For all that do so are abomination unto the Lord thy God. Well, I'm going to read that because even today you got the issue of transgenderism. He said you don't wear something if you're a man that's pertaining to a woman. Because he has distinct, clear roles and sexes for both male and female. So let's start with this, then it go into other things. That people will do trying to be the opposite sex. Oh, that's going on up here. And the Lord's telling you you shouldn't do it. If you're a man and you think you're a woman, you have something going on mentally. That's just like if you're a man going after going after other men, that's something going on mentally. There's no, there's no, there's no uh science <coughs> saying that that's what you should do or that you were born that way. That's like the, the boy, he came to school, he said, I'm trans penguin. And he wearing a penguin suit every day. And, the, and, the, and he, he recorded, it's on YouTube, he recorded a, a, a video of him talking to the administrators. They, was, they were trying to plead with him. Well, you can wear the penguin suit, but can you please just take off the, the head because it's a distraction. But he walking around in a penguin suit. But how you going to say something to him? You got, people, you got boys walking around in dresses? He said he a penguin. What you gonna do? That shit is there, man. You better. You got five minutes to get in some regular clothes. But they can't do that in the public school because everything 
Everything go now. You got in Virginia where they got, uh, it was in Virginia, I know it was in California, it's another state where they got mandatory homosexual curriculum. They teaching the babies. They got, they got uh, trans folk coming in there to read kids stories. Let me read you about two dads. Romans 1, the whole world is going after some foolishness. And understand, I'm not, I'm not up here talking like I'm, I'm saying, oh, it's going to get back right. <laughs> I'm not talking up here like, oh, we, you know, this, this battle lost. I'm going to still tell you about yourself. <laughs> I'm going to still tell you. Got to. Romans 1 and verse 18. What the book say? For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. All the truth and unrighteousness. So the whole world, brothers and sisters, is guilty. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. What truth do they hold? Verse 19. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God has showed it unto them. He showed them something. All mankind. There's been a universal revelation of God to man. You know man exists. How do you know? Verse 20. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. Mm-hmm. Being understood by the things that are made. He's revealed himself through his creation. See, for all the pseudoscience that people come up with trying to explain our existence, the reality is, is the creation testifies of the existence of God. The heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament show this handiwork. The sun shows you that there's a God. So you know there's a God. So once you know that there's a God, your next logical step is trying to find out what that God requires of me to do. There's something bigger than you and I. There's something bigger than the lust that we have within ourselves. And that is to do the will of God. That's why I said what, what's the, the whole duty of man is to fear God and keep his commandments. How could that be? Because it's somebody bigger than you. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his what? Even his eternal power in Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Ain't no excuse. I didn't know. Why weren't you trying to find out? You trying to find out everything else. You want to make some money, you're gonna try to find out how to do the stock market, how to buy some real estate. You want to win that pinnacle, you on YouTube. But you ain't trying to get salvation. You ain't trying to find out what this guy who did all this, <clears throat> who you had made in the image and the likeness of, requires? That's, that's your fault. You don't have an excuse. Verse 21. Because that wouldn't, they knew God. When they, they knew God, they what? They glorified him not as God. They didn't glorify him as God, neither what? Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was dark. Their foolish heart and their mind was dark, and now you in darkness. Professing themselves to be wise, they think they're wise in their in their philosophy, in their thoughts, in their paradigms. Professing themselves to be wise, they became what? Fools. Fools. And what did these fools do? He's talking about humanity throughout the course of human history. What has man done? Verse twenty-three. And changed the glory of the uncorruptible God. Into an image made like the corruptible man at the birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. So now what they've done is they've changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image. They made idols. So when you make I he tell you, don't do that. But when you make an idol, if you can make a God, you know what else you can make? The standards of that God. You can make the God, shape the God, even though it's not God, and your foolish man, what you doing? Oh, I'm, I'm making a God. Wouldn't you be God if you make it a God? Or can you even make a God? You can't make a God. That don't make no sense. But that's what people have done. They make it a God and then they have put upon that God their own standards of morality. Not what his, what his law says, but what they say. So that's that, now, now God becomes whatever you say. And he accepts whatever you say. But the reality is, is that he has his own standard of morality. It says, and change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like the corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Verse 24. Wherefore, well, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. So what's the result of this? 
You have denied God. So in denying God, you have denied morality. That's why you have more relativism and nihilism today because you have put God by the wayside and you've come up with your own standard and your standard is based on your wretched carnal state. And the Lord would allow you to do that. He will leave you to your own devices. You turn your back on him, he'll turn his back on you. <laughs> and say, now see, and look at you say, now see who this going to hurt, me or you. It's going to hurt you. Well, for God also gave them up to uncleanness to the lust of their own flesh. What would cause you to do such a thing? What would cause you to make a God and be an idolater? What would cause you to do it is your flesh. Your carnal nature, which is wicked. Verse 25. Who changed the truth of God into a lie. Uh -huh. And worship and serve the creature more than the creator. Who is blessed forever. Amen. Go ahead. For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections. So he gave them up unto vile affections. Meaning he allows you to do what you want to do. Don't mean you're not going to pay, but he's going to allow you to do what you want to do. And what has what man done? But even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. You got women with women. He left you to your own devices. And now you want another woman when clearly nature tells you, clearly anatomy tells you that you need another man. You need a man rather than a woman to be together. You can put on some Timberlands. You can put on some big jeans and sad. You can put a sports bra on and then take down your breasts. You can start taking hormones. You can try to look as manly as you want, grabbing stuff that's not there. You still a woman. You still a woman. For this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections for even their women to change the natural use into that which is against nature. It's against nature. Lesbianism is against nature. What about the men? Verse 27. And likewise also the men leave the natural use of the womb, uh -huh. burning their lust one toward another. So now you got the men going after men. Look at the world right now. See, you ain't going to be able to put this back. It's reserved for fire. You can't fix this. It's like something you break something like, oh, I got bad new one. That's the situation with man right now. And likewise, also the men leaving the natural use of the woman, burning their lust one toward another. Men with men working at, that's unseemly. And receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, which was meat, meaning it was fitting. The violence that you invite within yourself and you view a man dealing in homosexuality. That is a violent act. That is a violence against your own body. Anatomically, it's incorrect. So when you look up and you have all this disease and all this illness, you brought that upon yourself because of what was going on in your mind. What was coming up out of your flesh. Ultimately, it's the denial of God. Because when you engage in this sin, you say it ain't no God. Or it ain't no God I'm concerned with. You think with a man, you can't. And, and that's another thing. God loves gay people or homosexuals or adulterers. Where you see that at? Where you see that at? What Bible verse is that? Well, they, they actually are purporting that in a lot of churches. Was it the, what church was it that they had a big thing? They was about to have a break. And they was voting on whether they could have gay clergy. Getting married and, and acknowledging the marriages, y'all might as well pack that church up and everybody just leave. What are y'all doing? That ain't, that ain't the work of God. He clearly telling you that's abomination. So it says, and likewise, also the men leaving the natural use of the woman, burning their lust one toward another. Men with men working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, which was meat. But you look on TV and you look at Look everywhere, and they are promoting that agenda. So the, the older people here, even myself, they know that we ain't really going for that. But they got these kids. They got the babies. They for that. They got the children. They got the, and that's what they want. They want the babies. They got them. So when you look up, and, and your son is skinny jeans, and he, he don't know what's doing himself, a lot of that is the social engineering that he's receiving in school, receiving through the media, receiving everywhere. Now it's even in the curriculums. But it's an abomination. 
Verse 29. It was 28. 28, thank you. And even as they did not like to retain God in the knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. So now you got a, a mind of a reprobate to do those things which is not, that are not convenient. That's your state. Let's go to Jude. See, like I said, brothers and sisters, we need to take heed to what the Bible said. The Bible's not just good reading. The Bible's telling you what's about to happen. We in Jude. We in Jude, the uh, first chapter, and it was only one chapter. We in uh, verse, verse 5. Jude 5. Jude 1 and 5, because we should understand why these things were written about when people were dealing in this type of sin. When you ready, go ahead. I will therefore put you in remembrance that you once knew this. Uh -huh. How that the Lord having saved the people out of the land of Egypt afterward destroyed them that believe not. So we should understand these examples of unbelief and the denial of God. He saved the people and when they sinned against him, he kicked them out of the land. You can't just do what you want to do with this God. You better show some reverence. I'm going to put you in remembrance. I'm going to remind you of how I can save the people of the land after we destroyed them that believe not. They died in the wilderness. And then he kicked them out of their own land after he brought them in. But verse 6. And the angels which kept not their first estate. The angels who was up there in heaven, they got cast to the earth under the chains of darkness reserved to fire. Go ahead. But left their own habitation. Uh -huh. He had reserved an everlasting chains in the darkness until the judgment of the great day. Until the judgment of the great day, they're going to be saying these angels going to be cast into the lake of fire. That's why when the, when the Lord came to that one who had a familiar spirit, he said, has thou come to torment us before the time? He know he got, he got but a short time. And who else? Verse 7. Even in Sodom and Gomorrah uh -huh. and the cities of our them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh. What were they doing in, in, in Sodom and Gomorrah? Fornication, going after strange flesh. Let us bring those men out that we may know them. They were talking about the angels. They didn't know they was angels. And what happened? Go ahead. I set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. See, that's an example. He rained down fire and brimstone on Sodom and Gomorrah. That's what he's going to do to the whole world when he returns. Why? Look at it. Look at it. It's worthy to be burned. Luke, the 17th chapter. And that's what he's going to do. Luke, the 17th chapter, and verse 26. Luke 17 and verse 26. When you ready, go ahead. And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. What happened? They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. See, they were going about their daily lives. People going about, they delivering mail. People going about their daily life. They shopping down there. They riding dirt bikes. They doing everything they want to do. And they're not worried about what's about to happen. He says, they didn't eat, they drank, they married God, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark. Noah was a preacher of righteousness for warning them about what was to come. But notice, did nobody get on that ark but him and his wife and his sons and their wives. Eight souls were saved. Relatively speaking, that's how it's going to be when the Lord returns. Where it says the earth is going to be burned a few men left. The verse uh, 28. Likewise, also as it was in the days of Lot. What did they do? They did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. They, but they were engaged in sin. Verse 29. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom and rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. And destroyed them all. What's going to happen in these last days? Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Just the same way. All this sin going on back then, nobody paying no attention, and then sudden destruction. S destruction is coming again. Destruction is coming again. This last place, 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians, the sixth chapter, and verse, and verse 9. Because, see, ultimately, brothers and sisters, it's about salvation. 
and inherited the kingdom of God. You inherited the kingdom of God, flesh and blood can't inherit the kingdom of God. So you inherit the kingdom of God. That means you have an eternal body that can do that. Well, we're gonna pick it up in verse nine, first Corinthians six and nine. We ready? Go ahead. No, ye not the, that the unrighteous should not inherit the kingdom of God. So the unrighteous are not going to inherit the kingdom of God, regardless of the fact that you have created a God with the imagination of bad imagination of your mind. That don't mean that that God can save you. That God don't have a kingdom to put you in. The God that the minister lied about don't have a, ki a kingdom to put you in. No, you're not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So you need to change your way. He says, be not deceived, neither what? Neither fornicator, uh -huh. nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor feminine, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. Now, wait a minute. He said, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. So look, the fornicator, the idolater, the adulterer, the homosexual, who else? Nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards. Nor thieves, the covetous, the drunkard, or who? The revilers, no extortioners, shall inherit the kingdom of God. You're not getting in the kingdom of God. You're not going to get in. But then he says something, if you will, we read verse 11. As such as were some of you. But as, you know, as such were some of you. Meaning such were some of those who were not coming into the truth. Just like many of us in here were engaged in all kind of things. But it's time to leave all that behind. And such were some of you, but ye are washed. But ye are what? But you are sanctified. You're sanctified. You're set apart. You're not supposed to be doing what the world does. But you are what? But you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Because you were bought with a price and you justified through him. That's how you get justification. That's how you get it. I did want to show you all some things. Hold on. I want to show you some things quickly about just the state of affairs and what's going on. This is just, just to see, just to get, just step back and just look at the whole picture when it comes to sexual morality. This is from an article of PRN a news, PR Newswire. It's talking about Ashley Madison. This is an adultery website where you can commit to help you commit adultery. They got sixty million people. On. They had a. Uh, and increased in the last year. And they have 14,500 14, new member accounts every day. Just out of wedlock births. We're talking about illicit sexual behavior. Having out of wedlock births, these are all kinds of things that you don't want. Poverty, lack of education, Abuse, all these things could take place when there's no, if there's no father there. A lot of times, that's what you see. You see a lot of homes uh, led by single women. This is Washington Examiner. This is uh, actually came out last year. More than three quarters of African American births are to unmarried women. So they're they understand their statistics when they're doing them holistically like this. Come a year behind, a couple years behind. So 2015. 77.3% of non-immigrant black births were illegitimate. See, that's what we're producing. Illegitimate children. STDs. Uh, this came out uh, in August August 28th. This is from a CNN article. Rates of syphilis, gonorrhea, and chlamydia have climbed for the fourth consecutive year in the United States. The Center for Disease Control Prevention announced Tuesday at the National STD Prevention Conference. You want a conference on how to prevent it, you come up with, well, maybe we need some prophylactics. Maybe we need uh, sex ed in schools. No, what you need to do is have some morality. Last year, nearly 2.3 million U.S. cases of these sexually transmitted diseases were diagnosed. That don't mean that's how many there are. That's how many that are diagnosed. That's the highest number ever reported. Nationwide, breaking the record set in 2016. This is just something, again, dealing with you got illicit sexual behavior, so you got all these children that are born out of wedlock, and then you got a bunch of children that are not born at all. 
This says in 2016, as in previous years, more African-American babies were aborted than were born alive in New York City. Out of the 47,718 total, total reported pregnancies experienced by non-Hispanic black women, almost half, 49%, ended in abortion, while 4% ended in miscarriage, and only 47% ended in live births. Among African-American women in their 20s, the abortion rate was a staggering 85 abortions per 1,000. By contrast, Asian and Pacific Island women overall had the lowest ending in abortion. 13% of Asian and Pacific Island women in their 20s had an abortion rate of 15.5 abortions per 1,000. This is from CS News Transmania. You see that today. This is from a feminist author. She said something about what's happening here. And I'm going to just read. I know it's kind of small. She said, this best-selling feminist author, social critic, and self-described trans transgender being, Camille Paglia, said in an interview last month that the rise of transgenderism in the West is a symptom of decadence and cultural collapse. She didn't celebrate it. She said it means the culture and the in the, in, the, in the world is being in the West is being destroyed. It's a sign of that. Nothing better defines the decadence of the West to the jihadists than our toleration of open homosexuality and this transgender mania now. She said that on TV in Brazil. Then she says, uh what says Paglia also said during the interview that transgender propagandists are overstating their case. I think that the transgender propagandists make wildly inflated claims about the multiplicity, multiplicity of gender. So in other words, she's saying you got you don't have all these genders. You look at what is it, Facebook, you got 20 things you can be. But the Lord said you got male and female. Nonetheless, it says sex reassignment surgery, even today with all of its advances, cannot in fact change anyone's sex. You can't do that. Okay, you cut off ad, they don't change what you are. You can define yourself as a trans man or a trans woman as one of these new gradations along the scale, but ultimately every single cell in the human body, the DNA in that cell remains coded for your biological birth. This is the last one. Consequences of homosexuality. Black African American gay and bisexual men are more affected by HIV than any other group in the United States. In 2017, African American gay and bisexual men accounted for 26% of the 38,739 new HIV diagnoses and 37% of new diagnoses among all gay and bisexual men in the United States and dependent areas. So those are the consequences, or just some of the consequences for that behavior. And that's sexual morality according to the Bible. So I was my prayer that you were edified. <laughs> and in fact, we're going to stand up, we're going to face Jerusalem and close out. Our oh, Father, which art in heaven. Our Father, which art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. Thy will be done. In earth. In earth. As it is in heaven. As it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts. And forgive us our debts. We forgive our debt to us. As we forgive our debt to us. And lead us not into temptation. Lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil. But deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom. Thine is the kingdom. And the power. And the power. And the glory. And the glory. Forever. Forever. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. For he is good. For he is good. And his mercy endures forever. And his mercy endures forever. Praise the Lord God of Israel. Praise the Lord God of Israel. For he is good. For he is good. And his mercy endures forever. And his mercy endures forever. These things we pray in Jesus' name. These things we pray in Jesus' name. The Holy One of Israel. The Holy One of Israel. The Mighty One of Jacob. The Mighty One of Jacob. The Lord of Lords. The Lord of Lords. And King of Kings. And the King of Kings. Amen. Amen. Why you said that it was only happen when you were talking? No, it's you. Because it's rubber. You think so? Yeah, no. Cut it off. Nah, he went back when you just did. <laughs> you were leaning up against that, and then it went back. See, it doesn't do it in that one. I was talking on you when you was talking.
Perfect for you. No, not this time. Not this time. Not this time. Not this time. Anybody, uh, I want to acknowledge those that are still in line. Oh, just, uh, I mean, not those who are listening <coughs> via the internet. Uh, so it's a blessing to have you with us. Anybody have any questions? Good. Anybody have any questions in here? Please? Yes, sir. I'm not exactly clear about the abomination and desolation. I was wondering if you could elaborate on that. Okay. One second. I will do that. Uh, we could do that. Elijah. Go get a. Uh, uh, fee sheet, real quick. For me, please. Oh, it's one of you. Oh, never mind. I got it. Thank you. Uh, before I do that, also, I want to uh, just remind everybody that the Passover begins uh, Thursday, April 18th, at sundown, and ends Friday, April 19th. The sundown service will be held on Thursday, April 18th, at 7 p.m. You got the uh, Friday, April 19th, or the feast of the first day of Feast of Love of the Bear begins Friday, April 19th at sundown and ends Saturday, April 20th at sundown. S service will be held on Saturday, April 20th at 1 p.m. Okay. Uh, so now, the brother had a question about. I'm sorry. The, the, the Passover is the seventh week. Did you give us a time? I'm sorry, say that again, sir. Did you give us a time for the Passover? Well, we're going to be here at seven, but, you know, it'll take a little. Okay. Yeah. 7 30. Yeah. Um, so the brother had a question about the abomination of desolation. Yes, sir. Okay, so let's go to uh, Matthew 24th chapter. And so here in Matthew 24th chapter, verse 3, the disciples come unto him because he's he tells them that. You know, they show him the buildings of the temple. And he said, listen, this is going to be destroyed. And they asked him a specific question. Well, he said, see, not all these, not all these things. Barely I say unto you, I'm in verse 2. There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. In verse 3, they asked him. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately saying, tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? So that's. That's from the time that and also what's happening right prior to his coming. So he warns, he says, take heed that, in verse four, take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name saying, I am Christ and shall deceive many. Probably out of memory. And shall deceive many. And it says, and ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled for all these things must come to pass. The end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famines and pestilences, earthquakes and diverse places. All that's just the beginning of sorrows. Then shall you be delivered up. Shall you, then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted. I'm in verse 9. And they shall kill you. And shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Okay, so he talk about the false prophets in verse 11 that's going to rise. But then he gives you a specific sign that is very uh, different. He says in verse 15, when ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in a holy place Whoso read it, let him understand. So now this is a man, the abomination of desolation. He's standing in the holy place. His presence there in Mark, uh, the, what, in Mark the uh, 13th chapter, he tells you he's standing in a place where he ought not. Okay? So now, but he, he in uh, verse 14, 13 and 14, he said, but when you, in Mark, but when ye shall see the abomination and the desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing where it ought not, let him that un readeth understand it. Then let understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee to the mountains. Before we go to Daniel, where he was referring to, let's see what Paul says because he says it clearly. He's talking about this man. Uh, we in Thessalonians. Give me one second. Second. second Thessalonians. Thank you. The second chapter and verse one, because he's telling them in 2 Thessalonians the first chapter about this uh, the return of the Messiah and, and he says in verse 1 now we beseech you brethren by the coming of, of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us as that the day of Christ is at hand let no man deceive you by any means 
Well, that day shall not come. What day? The day of the Lord when he come back. He said some things got to happen first. I'm in 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 3. He says, let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. Apostasy has to happen first. And that man of sin be revealed. The son of perdition. So who is he talking about? He's talking about the abomination and desolation here. And then where is he, what is he going to be doing? Verse 4. Who opposed and exalted himself above all that is called God. So he's contrary to God and exalts himself above God. Or that he said all that is called God or that is worshipped. So that this is what he does. So that he as God sitteth in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. So now we should understand a couple of things. One, when it said in Matthew 24 and 15, when it's talking about you're going to stand in the holy place, that's where the temple is. But we should also understand there's no temple right now and the temple is going to be rebuilt. So he's going to stand in the temple and that's how he can, that's why he's standing where he ought not. And that's why he's an abomination. Now let's go to Daniel the ninth, the ninth for Daniel the seventh chapter. Because Daniel the seventh chapter, and I'm gonna pick it up at verse uh just get right to it. Verse 25 is talking about what this man is gonna do. Now he's coming up in his fourth kingdom. Now you got four kingdoms that rose. You got Babylon, the Medes and the Persians, the Greeks and the Roman, Roman Empire. Now, the time for the Roman Empire that ended, at least militarily and politically, was 476 A.D. But it continued through spirituality. It has dominion and even reigns. It has great power because it has sway over billions of people. Even the Christians today have been influenced by the Catholic Church. That's why she's called the mother whore. These, these Protestant denominations are her, are her children. they little whores. And the, the highest position in, in that in Christendom is the Pope. So it says what he's going to do, verse 25, and he shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High. This is, this is during great tribulation. It says, and think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand until the time and times and the dividing of time. Why is that significant? Because that time, which is one year, and times is two years, and the dividing of time, that's a half a year, you add it together, that's three and a half years. It's referring to the man that's going to come up during the, the three and a half year great tribulation. So again, he said, he shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and think to change times and laws. And they shall be given into his hand until the time and times and the dividing of time. Now let's go to uh, another place. Let's go to Daniel. The 11th chapter, because it's still talking about this man. Now, in Daniel, the 11th chapter, we should understand that this man is saying the son of perdition, this abomination of desolation is foreshadowed by a man named Antiochus Epiphanes, who came in the old time and he, he defiled the altar. He offered swine upon the altar. He was an abomination, but he foreshadowed the man of sin that was to come. He's talked about uh, in Daniel 11, beginning at verse 21. But then we are told about that one that's going to come with a sinless spirit, only he's going to have great power. This is Daniel 11, chapter verse 36. It says, and the king shall do, he's, and he's calling him a king because we should understand, too, that the pope, and that's what this is talking about, is also a sovereign. He is a monarch. He, he resides over or reigns over Vatican City. And in the, in the old days, the pope had many more uh, lands. They had so much power that they were the ones that would crown the, the kings or the other or the, or the, or the people that would try to even restore the uh, Roman Empire. Like people like Charlemagne. The Pope would, would bring him. When Napoleon came, you know, he took the crown from the Pope and crowned himself. He's like, you ain't crowning me. Because that's what they tell you who got, who got the power. That's similar to how like we were talking about David David was, uh, he was anointed by Samuel, God's man that he sent to do that. 
But so in Daniel 11, chapter and verse 36, it said, and the king shall do according to his will. Again, it's talking about the abomination and the desolation when they call him king. He shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every God. We read about his haughtiness in 2 Thessalonians, chapter 2. He's going to exalt himself above all gods, so that's, that, that is called God. He says, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every God and shall speak marvelous things against the God of gods. Even some of the titles of this man, vicar of Christ. That means you're placing the son of God. That's not who you are. Though. Nevertheless, it says, and shall speak marvelous things against the God of gods and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished for that that is determined shall be done. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers nor the desire of women. No regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all. But in his estate shall he honor the God of forces. And a God whom his fathers knew not shall he honor with gold and silver and with precious stones and pleasant things. Thus shall he do in the most strongholds of the strange God, whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory. He shall cause them to rule over many and shall divide the land for gain. Okay, now he's he's having uh, power in certain areas here. If you keep reading. So the king of the south push at him and the king of the north, that's Russian and, out, and her allies coming against him out of the east. Verse 41, he shall enter also into the glorious land and many countries shall be overthrown, but these shall escape out of his hand. Even Edom and Moab and the chief of the children of the mind. That's in present day Jordan. And it says, I'm going to skip down a little bit. It says, uh, well, actually, I want to stop there. I want to go to Revelation and just pick up something else. We'll go to Revelation the uh, 13th chapter. Revelation the 13th chapter. Because here in Revelation, it also tells you about this man of sin. Okay? Now, I want to pick it up in verse 1 just to, just, to, just to point out what I was saying about the Roman Empire. It says in verse 1, And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his head the name of blasphemy. Now, that's talking about the reunification of the Roman Empire. Because, again, you have Babylon which represented the head. If you look at the beast that Daniel describes in, in, in the book of Daniel, you got uh, the bear, which was the Medes and the Persians. Then you got the Greeks, but that was that was represented in four heads because when Alexander the Great died, he, he conquered the world and he died and four rose up to take uh, different parts of his kingdom. Lysimachus, Cassandra, Seleucus, and Ptolemy. And then you had that one beast that was outside of anything in the animal taxonomy that we've ever seen. One beast so terrible that we can't describe. That's seven heads. These ten horns represent uh, men. Okay? So now it says, and the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. Okay, so now the Satan is going to be behind this kingdom. And it says, and I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wanted after the beast. Okay? So why, what does it mean is healed? Because it's coming back into its prominence. We see it today through the rise of the European Union. That's nothing but the reunification of Rome. The Roman Empire. Now, uh, let's skip down a little bit to verse uh, 5. It says, and there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. What we was reading in Daniel. This man blasphemed. It says, and power was given unto him to continue 40 and two months. How long is 40 and two months? Time, times, and the dividing of time. Three and a half years. That's not a coincidence. You're talking about the same time. You're talking about the same man. This man going to rise up during great tribulation. It says, and he opened his mouth and blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints. We read that in Daniel. What it says in Daniel, he's going to wear out the saints. And to overcome them, he's going to be killing God's people. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. I want to skip down a little bit so we can identify him. It says in verse uh, 12, 
And he exercised all the power of the first beast before him and caused of the earth and then was dwelled therein to worship the first beast whose daily wound was healed. And he drew a great wonder so that he'd make a fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. So he's going to have power from Satan to make, to make lightning come down, to make fire come down from heaven on the earth. And it says, and deceive them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast. Saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by its word and did live. Just like Bab uh, in Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar made an image. And he said, all y'all, once he got that dream and Daniel interpreted, he made an image. He said, all y'all got to bow down and worship it. This man during the great tribulation, this abomination and desolation, this man is sin, this son of perdition, the quote unquote Antichrist, is going to make an image. Only thing is, he going to get through the power of Satan. He going to get his image power this, to, to, uh, to speak. It's going to have power to speak. Verse 15. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast shall both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. So if you don't fall down, just like in the days of Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they didn't bow down to their image. They were thrown into the, into the fiery furnace. Now the Lord, uh, the Lord uh, protected them, but we should understand he's going to do the same thing here and people just going to be beheaded. But if you do bow down to this image, you're going to be Now this same man, it says in verse 16, that's causing the people to be killed that don't worship his image. It says he calls it all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. That's what's called, quote, unquote, the mark of the beast. People talk about what that is. Is that biometrics? Is that some RFID chip? Is it just a mark in their head? We don't know. But what we do know for certain is that it's associated with worship. So in taking that mark, you are acknowledging that you worship this image and that you are down with this beast system. And it says, and that no man might buy or sell say that he had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Just to show you how real simple this could be, you look at India, they have a system today where they scan your retina. They have all, you got a bit over a billion people in India. And approximately almost all of them are in a system to where they have your medical record, they have everything. You just look at You go in a, uh, was it Sweden? Can't think of the country right now, right now, maybe nowhere. Sweden, one of these countries where they got thousands of people, they got RFID chips in their hand right now, and they swipe that to get on the train. So that kind of technology is already here, but it's going to be associated directly with worship. And that's a direct affront to God. So he says, you not, but you, if you don't take it, you ain't going to be able to buy or sell. Okay. He says, verse 17, and that no man might buy or sell, save that he had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Then he will give you some wisdom as to who this is. His, here is wisdom that him that hath understanding count the number of the beast. For it is the number of a man, and his number is 603 score and 6, 666. We heard that. People said it's Ronald Reagan. People said it's Barack Obama. He's black and president. He must be an antichrist. No. It's talking about the Pope. And one of the Pope's titles is Vicarious Finite Day. It's Latin for replacement or the, for the son of God. If you line up what his, his name means, it's about the Latin to give numerical value to the, to the letter, it adds up to 666. That identifies him. So that's who it is. He's coming out of the office of the papacy. So what he's going to do, he's going to rise up during the Great Tribulation. He's going to cause this, he's going to stand in the holy place, which is the temple that's going to be rebuilt. That's going to start the Great Tribulation. He's going to wreak havoc on his earth. Okay? He's going to cause people to get a mark uh, and, and, and make them acknowledge that they worship the system. And if they don't, he's going to kill them. What else is the man going to do? He is, and he's being empowered through Satan. He's had a power to do miracles, and he's going to do this for three and a half years. At the end of the three and a half years, he's going to come to his end. Um, I did want to read one other thing, and then I'll be done, because at the time... When all this is going on, the Lord does have a place of safety for his people. Real quick, I'm revelating this last place. Unless my father has some Revelation, the 12th chapter and verse 13. It says, and when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, he persecuted the woman, was brought forth a man child. The woman that brought forth a man child is 
It's talking about his church, talking about Israel. And the man child was talking about the Messiah. The Messiah came up out of Israel as Jesus. Verse 14, and to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness. That's figurative language. She's not literally on wings of eagles, but that's talking about the deliverance of God that he's going to have for his people. I'm in Revelation, the 12th chapter, verse 14. That's the that's the uh, deliverance that he's going to have for his people during the time of the great tribulation. The time when this man of sin is in power. So it says, and to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness. Where it says, into her place where she is nourished for a time and times and a half a time. That should sound familiar. 42 months. Time, times is divided into time, three and a half years. So she, so his church, his people are going to be in the wilderness. He's going to deliver them into the wilderness. And it's not a coincidence that when we read in Daniel, at least I don't think it's a coincidence. We read in Daniel that the, the lands that escape from the rain or from, from the uh, destruction of the man of sin are Ammon, Moab, and Edom. Okay? That's, that's a portion of where the wilderness was in Jordan. Okay? So I just want to point you that something. So does that help? Yes, sir. I'll praise the most I eat. No. I want to put a question right on. Is that the same hope that's going to be cast in a lake of fire for a thousand years before? He's there. And even when you go up. So the question was, is that the same pope that's going to be there uh, for a thousand years prior to Satan? Yes, he's going to be there. Because um, when the Satan comes in, in the beast, so he's got the military stars politically to end him. They both cast into the lake of fire. It's not a coincidence either, because when you see the wrong the, the reign of Rome, it was always dual. There was duality there. You had you had a, a spiritual leader and you had a political slash military leader who were emperor and so forth. And in Isaiah 66, when the Lord establishes his reign on the earth, what do you see? It says in, in 66 and 23, and it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith the Lord. And they shall go forth and look upon the carcasses of the men that have transgressed against me. What carcasses of what men? The beast and the false prophet cast into the lake of fire. We know that because it is. It said, for their worms shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched, and they shall be an abhorring unto all flesh. So when people go up to Jerusalem as they're supposed to at the appointed times in his kingdom, they are going to see the beast and the false prophet burning in the lake of fire. Good? Yes, sir. All yes. praise the most high. You have a question? There's two questions. Um, so the first question states does non-sexual intimate contact like hugs or sleeping in the same bed as your wife during her menstrual cycle cause the husband to be unclean technically okay so the question is One more time. does hugs or non-sexual non -sexual intimate, in intimate contact it technically it technically it can potentially because uh you yeah, anything that she's touching, it can potentially do that. You want to add? Yeah. It can do that. Yeah. So another question? I, I, I guess I will read it. Uh, this is in Leviticus. Right? Uh, let's see. See, and, and we should understand. Uh, let's see. And see, we should understand, too, that then they had, you know, they had the seven days of separation, but they also had uh, their cultures, with, they, were, they were separated for that time because of that. Um, this is Leviticus. Give me one second. Leviticus, you remember what I said? Leviticus, this uh, Leviticus of oh, 18, but I'm, maybe I'm looking at, I know it's more than one spot. Uh, give me one second. Okay. Leviticus 15, is it? Leviticus 15, let's see. Hold on. Uh, Leviticus 20. Leviticus 20. You 
15? Just do it there. Okay, thank you. The make is 15. Uh, let's see. And I'm at verse 25. Thank you. And if, I mean, Leviticus 15 and 25, it says, and if a woman have an issue of blood many days out of the time of her separation, or if it run, it says, or if it, uh, let's see. Or if it run beyond the time of her separation, all the days of the issue of her uncleanness shall be as the days of her separation. She shall be unclean. Every bed whereon she lies, all the days of her issue shall be unto her as the bed of her separation. And whatsoever she sitteth upon shall be unclean as the uncleanness of her separation. I understand. Like, I know we do things. We do a, we do everything that was given to us. They, you know, when you look into it, sometimes they even had separate dwelling quarters for women um, during that time. Because of this, because they were they were a nation that was that was that was steady trying to remain clean because they were dealing directly with the Lord. Um, so when you look at the laws of cleaning, a lot of laws of cleanliness, and that was one. So, yeah, they might have separate quarters for a woman who was who was unclean. Um, is there another question? Thank you. You want to add? I'm sorry. Thank you. You had another question. Um, okay. He said in Amos 2 and 6, is it talking, is it referring to Jesus with the silver? So in 2 and 6, when it says they sold the righteous for silver, is that referring to Jesus? Okay, so, uh, Amos 2 and 6. So Amos 26 says, Thus saith the Lord, for three transgressions of Israel, and for four I will not turn away the punishment thereof, because they sold the righteous for silver and the poor for a pair of shoes. So what's the question? Is it referring to Jesus selling Jesus for silver? Is, is that referring to Jesus? Okay. Um, no. You got you something? No. I, it, well, I think what they're talking about is something else, but uh, so no, that's not talking about that. I'm sorry, he's going to go. Tell me, you think you pick up the matzo? Excuse me, brother. Did you need you want some of these uh these matzo here? You want a box? Sure, sure. Um, I think what they're talking about is something else. Uh, give me, give me one second to find it. He had unrighteous judgment. You go, you go ahead. I'm fine. No, I was just saying he had. I don't think the mic. Is the mic on? What he's talking about, he's talking about the transgressions of uh, Judah. And what they were doing, they were supposed to, uh, they were engaged in an unrighteous judgment. So it turns in another place like they're divine for hire, doing things, um, and they were doing it to get paid in terms of, as opposed to, even in the administering of the law, even in in the in the, in the service of, um, it's just like when Eli's sons they were taking advantage of the position that they had when the people that were coming to the temple went not to the temple when they were coming to sacrifice unto the Lord instead of uh, taking their portion as they were supposed to. They were taking advantage of the people. They were taking things from them that they shouldn't. So when it's talking about that they were selling, they sold the righteous for, for silver, they were just making a game. Uh, it's just like if you look at today, um, instead of executing righteous judgment, again, they were doing things for hire. They were doing things to get paid. This isn't in connection. It's not talking about. Uh, it's not talking about Judas 
And Jesus, this is talking about the nation as a whole, the people as opposed to just one individual, is what they were doing as a whole. And basically, these are those that were in leadership uh, cause the people to, to err. Can you tell that person to turn it down? What could potentially be referring to some silver that's referring to Jesus is in Zechariah 11 chapter. In Zechariah 11 chapter, uh, it says, uh, and it in Zechariah 11 and 11, and it was broken in that day, and so for the poor of the flock that waited upon me, that it was the word of the Lord. And I said unto them, If ye think good, give me my price, and if not forbear. So they weighed for my price 30 pieces of silver. I'm reading that perhaps that's what that individual is referring to. Because uh when you look at uh Matthew 27 chapter and verse verse uh let's see verse verse uh hold on one second actually uh Matthew 26 in verse 14, then one of Matthew 26 and verse 14, then one of the 12 called Judas Iscariot went unto the chief priests and said unto them, what will you deliver me? What will you give me? And I will deliver him unto you. And they covenanted for him for 30 pieces of silver. And from that time, the, uh, saw that yeah, so maybe is that it? He didn't respond. He didn't respond. Okay. All right. Everybody, did you have some news? All right. Uh, well, he just uh, said thank you. Oh, praise the Lord. We pass these out. Yeah. Um, we pass out these matzo. Huh? Yeah. Thank you.